Mindfulness and Jay came back to walk from All right, we will call this Monday, July 10th, uh, 2017 work session meeting of the Somerset School Board to order. Please take roll call. Brian Walton. Here. Katie Thurman. Here. Marie Colba. Here. Nancy Dressel. Here. Courtney Kukowski. Bob Gunther. Patty Schachner. Here. The mission of the Somerset School District is developing learners, empowering futures together. The vision statement is to become a premier community, bridging learners with their passions and pathways. Uh, please review the outcomes for this evening on our agenda. Um, as a board, we've been including public comments within our work session agenda while the policy is being reviewed. Are there any objections to hearing public comments tonight? Hearing none, is there anyone who wishes to make public comment this evening? Uh, hearing none, uh, board members, please review the protocols on our agenda. And then our first item this evening is academic and career planning. So I'll turn over to Kelly. All right, we have our whole crew left here. Um, can we pull that up too? When you, do you have the. Oh, no, I didn't have can it. Can we do that? Go ahead. By chance? On your computer there? Thanks. No, you're fine. Want the agenda? Yeah, that's fine. It should be linked right in there. Okay. Okay. You guys want to join me? Or you <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a good chunk of our ACP team, um, kind of our initial group that we will be growing. But thank you for having us in tonight. We're here to talk about academic and career planning. Um, we need to have our plan approved by our school board by the end of September. End of September, I think, right, Kate? Yes. No um, exactly. And so we are here today to tell you about our plan for academic and career planning. It is something that um, was mandated for this upcoming school year um, for the state to happen. And we, so we'll talk more about this, but we feel pretty proud. Um, Somerset is a school district that, as we've attended meetings and things, that we are finding that we are kind of well ahead of where others are. Um, and so this is kind of our team. This is available out there for you to view as well if you haven't done that yet. Um, so I and mean, we won't read through everything side by side, but um, this is just a short video on ACP that This is James. And this is Darla. James is really motivated in school. He loves science. Darla lives for cars. One thing they have in common is that their futures will work out better if they can get a little bit of their brain to start thinking right now about what they want to do. And that's why academic and career planning matters. You've probably heard about ACP by now. Did you know it's designed to help every single student and to involve the whole school? It's part of the whole student approach. Every educator has the opportunity to mentor kids. James' math teacher asks him a few good questions it helps him learn to devote that brain space to identifying his personal strengths and interests within the field of science. Once James knows some careers he's interested in, teachers and community members start helping him think of ways to explore them while he's still in school. He acquires more confidence as he takes these baby steps into the working world. By the time he gets to his senior year, he's even going to try a youth apprenticeship in biotechnology at a place suggested by one of his teachers and he never would have thought of it if it weren't for his teachers thinking about ACP. It turns out James wants to focus on different avenues, and if it weren't for the ACP process in middle and high school, who knows how many years and dollars it would have taken him and his family to figure that out and move him on to his next exploration. Now, Dharma benefits from her school's career fair, where she talks to different professionals in the automotive field. She arranges a job shadow with an automotive technician and she decides to explore automotive and aviation engineering. She even learns that for her goals, it'll help to have good literacy and math skills, too. Schools offer a lot of these options already, but it's the comprehensive nature of ACP that makes the most difference. It's more than the sum of its parts. With the help of many educators at their schools, James and Darla are not only motivated, <coughs> but they're planning for college and career personalizing their education and their experiences to align to their own sense of purpose, their unique visions for their future, 
No wonder it's part of the agenda of State Superintendent Tony Evers. You know, we want to make sure that every child is a graduate, college, and career ready. In order to make that happen in the state of Wisconsin, we have to make sure that academic and career planning is part of every child's education. This website has more about ACP in Wisconsin and tools to help you make the most of it in your school. So ACP starts at sixth grade, goes up um, through twelfth grade, obviously. Um, starting them young, hopefully, as we know, they have to choose very early on or start to venture into what they're um, planning to do. The <coughs> so what it is ACP is just a collaborative, collaboratively developed student-driven process. Um, where it's all about the students and helping them find post-secondary success um, in the future. Um, so it refers to a process that helps students engage in academic and career development um, through activities and through using an e-portfolio product, which the um, product that we're using is Peer Cruising. It is actually, uh, we'll, I don't know if we're going to dabble into it too much tonight, um, but we could certainly come back and do a little demo for you with a little bit more of what it, we'll talk about what it offers tonight. Um, but this is an e-portfolio in which the kids have access to and will be building throughout. Um, it is something that is being funded by the state of Wisconsin. <coughs> it's a four-year um, agreement that they will be funding it for the students um, for the next four years. So it becomes a lot this coming year. Um, we have been working on it for the past two years, two and a half years. Um, so the 16th, 17th school year, this past year, we did some exploring with our students and the educators in the classroom um, and making it what we want. The big push with this is that it's not just our counselors, but it's classroom teachers and everybody involved is part of this development with our students and working with them. Um, so Susie is going to talk about how this year we really implemented it in with our English department and then we're looking to grow a lot at the high school level and middle school level this coming year. Yeah, so ACP is kind of tagline or their model, know, explore, plan, and go. So understanding who each student is, um, that's both for themselves, for the educators, for us as counselors, for community members, helping them understand who they are so then they can kind of choose the paths that best fit um, kind of their, you know, personalities, their strengths, all of those things. So some of that self-awareness, those activities are done in the career cruising, which is awesome. Um, and then kind of helping fit schedules to those kind of qualities um, and those drives for those students. Explore, so what do I want to know? So helping them figure out, you know, what careers they're interested in, what they need to get to those careers, what it might look like in the high school, even after high school, so post-secondary planning, which is a big thing, helps kind of make things relevant for them, right? So what they're learning right now, how does that apply to my life um, later on? Uh, plan, so how do I get there? So what is it gonna look like for them um, at the high school level? You know, we do conferencing with the sophomores, mini conferences with sophomores, and then we do junior conferencing, so where we meet with all the juniors and kind of talk about, okay, where are you at right now? What are your plans for after high school? What do we need to do to support you to get you there? Um, and kind of make that tangible for them. So this is awesome because we do a lot of this work, but now we'll have it all housed in one place starting, you know, early on so we can kind of see their changes, see their growth, um, and help them kind of reflect on that as well and continue to understand who they are as a learner. Um, and go, go do it. So kind of continually reassessing things. Okay, this is where you were. Is this kind of still what you're feeling? Is there something else we need to kind of push for? Um, how can we continue to support you in all these career and educational pathways? Okay, so ACP training and implementation, um, there's a lot that we've done already. Um, you know, like they were saying, in 2015 it kind of like started to um, be kind of a dream and now it's something that will be implemented and, and we're required to do it. So it's kind of exciting, um, especially for counselors because this is a lot of the work that, that we did um, and then we saw other people doing in classrooms, but it wasn't something that was kind of like connected together at all times. Um, so that would be a little bit frustrating for, for students and for families. So we went to a lot of trainings at CESA, um, which were wonderful. Um, career cruising training, so again the computer system that the students will use, um, which is wonderful that the state will be paying for it because we used to use with careers, which cost $1,000 um, per building each year. So it's a savings that we'll have there. So that's a, a celebration. And it's apples um, and oranges as far as mm -hmm. we're concerned. Yeah. yeah. Too. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a Cadillac. Yep. I'm we're really yeah. excited about that. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we've been doing teacher surveys at the middle school and high school about current career and personal social curriculum going on in the classrooms um, and digging through that.
data to decipher how and when we could reach all students with ACP curriculum. So again, a lot of this stuff was happening, but it was kind of happening in pockets throughout each building. Um, and so really researching and figuring out, talking to teachers, like how can we make sure that all of this information is getting to all students, um, not just certain students that took certain courses, okay? Um, and then as a committee, we met weekly um, to talk about how are we gonna communicate what we're doing to all staff so everyone knows what's going on. Um, we built a website, um, the middle school website and high school website um, about ACP, um, creating building specific curriculum maps, which we'll show you, and then learning and setting up career cruising. So the program that we're talking about is amazing, but there's so much to learn. So, and we still have a lot to learn going forward. So I'm gonna show you the high school website um, the, the academic and career planning link. So this is just the high school website. Academic and career planning is on the left hand side and this is what it looks like when it comes up. There's that video um, that we just showed you so all families can see that video if they want to. And then this is, these are our curriculum maps that we have here. So the high school curriculum map, you can click on it. Anyone in the community can see this. Um, these are, like Katie was talking about the plan, kind of the left hand side is gonna go through the, the plan through the go. Um, so how are you, and then we'll show you the middle school one too, but the different things that kind of fit into those, each category, um, and which thing it fits into. So job shadowing or investigating, different options, mock interviews, reflection, kind of which department currently is doing it um, to make sure that we're reaching all students. That's totally a work in progress. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. That's what we have started with. You know, and this was something that work. as we were going through, it was super helpful to see where we had um, missing pieces. So right? we so we were really proud of the things that we were doing, but it was mm -hmm. like, uh-oh, we don't have um, enough job shadowing. We don't have enough like mock interviews. So our students are going to interviews like they probably don't even know what questions are going to be asked. And and we also saw a huge um, link to a lack of community interaction as far as the community knowing what we were doing. So those were some, and that's what was part of our CISA trainings, is kind of going through and seeing like a needs assessment, like what do you need more of at your school. So that training was really really valuable and then this is the middle school one so you can go through and kind of see this it's a lot of information to look at a um, couple of huge things that came out of um, work the collaboration is um, that we're change our schedule so that the eighth graders will have the first class <laughs> this has been a complaint of some and, and I understand that um, you know parents um, that they'll have the first class all eighth graders will have a careers class before they register in February. Mm -hmm. So they'll be done with the careers and then I teach a careers academic personal social skills class every day. Then they'll do the other part that you know the next half of the year and I think that's wonderful. Another our collaboration is that Kelly and I, maybe on Tuesdays and Thursdays or maybe once a month, we're gonna take eighth graders and high schoolers on job job mm -hmm. um, shadows um, during that first couple hours a day. So that's pretty cool. You know. Mm -hmm. There's we're more, to a lot of stuff highlights. in for students like 11th and 12th grade, and we were kind of finding that was almost too late. You know, so really pushing it down um, to the middle school and to 9th and 10th grade, so 11th and 12th they can really focus more on on what the classes need to be taking, so they're you know, getting really confused about that. Um, this is just one example of an activity we did at high school. So again, sitting down as a committee and like, how are we going to kind of launch this this year to get students excited about this and families? Um, so we showed all students the ACP video. And then we did a building-wide goal-setting day. And so everyone at the high school, 9 through 12, in homeroom during um, the same day we're, we're working on goal-setting. So talking about what are short-term goals, what are long-term goals, you know, where are you at right now, where are you going to currently, and kind of talking about goals within there. Um, some simple goals for the next couple of weeks, and then some lifelong goals of, of what you want to achieve. And then talking through that individually with your homeroom teacher, so they had a conference with their homeroom teacher and talked through that, so kind of creating a little bit of a relationship there, and then going into career cruising, the computer system, and recording that in there so they can kind of see what career cruising is all about and use it a little bit just to, as a refresher. So we're already getting past our time, but career cruising is a cat. was, well, let's say it's Almost a Cadillac. Now Beyonce is a Cadillac, but that's like twenty thousand mm -hmm. dollars, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but um, career cruising is a wonderful tool. Um, every year for the last decade, um, conferences across the state, of, all across the nation, have touted it to me. Um, 
So, so I'm pretty excited. I'm so excited that teachers will be able to see pull up class lists. This is always what went to a career fair. I'm in mean, a career um, um, seminar in Madison, and they said the more people talk to the kids about their own language and their career interests, the more that mm -hmm. it's inspiring. And um, they can pull up a uh, teachers can pull up a class list, see what their they can get into their portfolio portfolios there, and really understand the kids. One thing that we did in eighth grade that I showed Sarah, I said, I was so excited. I go, see this, come see this. Um, uh, what uh, my uh, SLO or PPG, I think it was, <laughs> um, that I'd sit down, Amy or I would sit down with every single child, make sure they had these specific things in career cruising. Um, and if we had to individually, you know, we did it in large group, but if we had to individually, we did it individually. And they came up with just such intricate goals. I mean, as a whole, it almost looked like 80% of them came up with very, can we push them to do that? So some of the things, um, parents will have access. Parents had access to WIS careers, likewise, but it's still, it's, it's, it's not as vast. I mean, there's so much, I've been in training for three years and there's still so much. It um, integrates with in the campus. We're still working on, you know, how we want to do that. We can personalize. Um, career cruising for our school district, and we have already done some of that for scope and secrets. Um, yeah. Uh, so some of the things, my journal, I do a lot in my journal. And I, I want to um, talk to the counselors and Kelly and, and Susie about, and other teachers about, you know, look at their journal. It's so inspiring. That, that, no, that's where we put out, there's long range plans, there's <laughs> short range plans, there's where I'm going to go to school, what scholarships I could look at, what, why the school looks good for me. And when I talk about college, I want to make sure that everyone knows, and I say this every, almost every day of the kids, <coughs> college means anything, well, it's like high school training. Um, matchmaker, they do, um, you know, a, <coughs> an assessment, per se, you know, of um, their career interest abilities. And my education, oh, it just goes into vast, you know, it shows, it, it shows colleges of, you know, in what their interests are, and they can compare schools and the amenities, and I want them to, you know, we try to push that too. Um, resume building look good. I think the high school uses that a little bit more than I do. Um, goals and plans, again, short range plans, long range plans, they can update them every year, and we do have them look at them and update them every year. And we're working on how we want, you know, the, we can um, print a parent ticket, but how do we want to get, ACP is actively involving the parents six through 12, multiple, multiple times a year with teachers and collaboration. So we're working on how we're, you know, this, we roll that out. We, we piloted basically this year, tippy toed into it the year before, and then next year we're ready to, you know, swim. So it's pretty exciting. Oh, it's, a career cuisine is also on our, it's on the website. You, it's just a student and staff button. Um, they can also, kids can access it for free forever. Mm -hmm. so they start to log in once a year. Yeah. Yeah. Right. They can request mm -hmm. transcripts right. through it. Um, it can also be an actual portfolio, so teachers can have mm -hmm. things that mm -hmm. you know they choose one artifact from that class that they want. So an electronic portfolio they can have access to. Again, like Kelly said, we'd love to demo it for you someday, but that would take way more of your time mm -hmm. than you want today. Okay. But it's a cool tool. So I was brought in uh, to the team kind of late in the game um, because we. Last year, without really even knowing that this was happening um, in our English classes for the sophomores, we started doing a career exploration unit. Um, and so Jenna and Katie and everybody kind of came to me and said, like, you know, what are you doing? Come join our team and whatever. Um, so even though, like, it's really detailed, career cruising is, you know, extensive, like Kate is saying, the other thing that I think is really cool is that it's really user-friendly. Um, we did it with the sophomores, and the sophomores, like, love it. They just go in and they click around and everything is laid out for them, and it's very clear, like, where they're going. Um, they play around with it. Um, they loved it. It was, for me as a teacher, it was cool because you had kids who said, I have no idea what I want to do. Um, and they did like the matchmaker and they laughed about the fact that they got like martial arts instructor. And everybody got a really solid laugh out of the fact that the 40th one on my list was high school educator. And then, you know, was, like literally where I did it uh, for fun and the kids were like, she's not even going to get teacher. And we're like scrolling, 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 scrolling. <laughs> you know, but like they, they got a good laugh out of it, you know, and, and um, you can click on them and it'll tell them why they got that. Like, because they're like, well, why would I be a good martial arts instructor? I don't want to do that. Um, and then you've got kids who have their whole career path lined out in front of them, um, and this was a chance for them to explore it. And so 
Um, we used career cruising to do kind of that sort of stuff. They looked at their educational path. They looked at the courses they would have to take in high school, uh, GPA requirements, um, you know, funding. It was really exciting for them to see how much money they were going to make. And some kids said, like, I can't make that much money. Like, I, that's, I'm not going to be able to survive on that. So then they would have to go back and redo it. And it was just cool. They really took uh, kind of the bull by the horns for, their, for themselves, which was really cool. Um, we, they then had to shadow a professional in, that, in their chosen career path. Um, we had students who watched a craniotomy happen live um, at, at Regions. Uh, we had students who shadowed dentists, teachers within our own buildings. Um, they went and saw engineers. One group got to go to like an aerospace engineering company and I think saw seven or eight different engineers and like the things that they do. Uh, and they came back and they were so excited, you know, like they had got free water bottles and that was just really <laughs> awesome. And kids who like normally wouldn't stop and talk to, you know, who wouldn't make it a point to come into my room, like showed up after school and they're like, You're never, you'll never believe what we saw today. You know, so it was really cool. It was definitely like building a bridge with the kids. Um, and then in the end, they put on a career fair for the eighth graders, um, which definitely has some kinks <laughs> to be worked out. Uh, but they they really, really did a, a nice job. So it was it was really a cool time to see it happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so kind of what's next with ACP? So we've been working on it for three years, and now you know it's required, and we really need to like launch it to the community. Um, so we want to ensure that the ACP is included in the upcoming strategic plan. You know, so we're kind of placed on committees within the strategic planning um, sessions at the end of the school year to make sure that this was something that was at the forefront of what we were doing. Um, recruiting more staff and community members to be on our committee, now that we kind of know what we're doing. Recruiting some people to join us. Um, continue documentation of community contacts and collaboration. Um, we know that that's really important, so continuing to do that. And developing a couple tools, one for student and parent feedback, and then also a self-evaluation tool, tool for ourselves. So each year to be kind of looking at like, what are some things that we need to change. We're aware that there's going to continue to be some holes that we need to fill. Um, you know, we're not going to jump in the first year and, and be total rock stars at this. So kind of evaluating throughout the year what are some more things that we need to do and, and possibly some things that we need to take off that weren't as effective as we thought we were going to be. So that's kind of where we're at. Any questions? <coughs> So they did not actually do it this year. So the kids that graduated this year really haven't played with it at all. A tiny, a tiny, tiny bit. bit. Mm -hmm. They did that goal setting. Mm -hmm. they, um, you know, our seniors were like, well, we kind of already know what we're, you know, they were kind of <laughs> at that point, which brought us to realize, like, these are the things we need to be doing way earlier mm -hmm. with them. And mm -hmm. so it was a good thing for us to look at, too. So a little bit we did, but... This year's seniors, like this 2017-18, they will have done the career exploration, like, before we did career cruising, but mm -hmm. they kind of started that. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that freshman really have a good mm -hmm. handle on it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Their career cruising sites look good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and easy. Sorry, yeah. go ahead. No, well, I was just say we're really excited about it at the high school because before they would come up with this amazing um, portfolio from the mm -hmm. middle school, but we all know that this like paper portfolio is so hard to, to manage and to sit down with each kid and kind of go through it. And, I'd be lying if I said that I went through all of my students' portfolios because I, mm -hmm. I just didn't. I, there was no time to do that. Um, but sitting down with students and parents, a lot of times I would go through it. And so this will be so much easier to just click through stuff. As she can just click mm -hmm. and then you click on a child and um, underneath it, do you want to see this? Do you want to see this? Do you want to see this? Do you want to see that? So, you know, one of it is the journal that I think that mm -hmm. is going to be very valuable. So it's just really fast. Mm -hmm. And, and the trainings have oh, been efficient. We're talking a lot about careers, but I think another thing to recognize, especially when you talk about the journal, is some personal social stuff. Mm -hmm. So something comes up, that's another tool that we can go into and see what's going on with this kid. A student may write in there like, I don't care about my future. Mm -hmm. That's a huge red flag, um, and that's perfect. A perfect red flag for us to recognize. And that's what we that's what we use this year. That mm -hmm. I went in there and I looked at every single one, and I found that, and then we conferenced. You know, I didn't have that before. That was cool. Yeah. Well, Sorry. this sounds really awesome. It does. Thank you so much for all your work on it. When I, back in the day, yeah. when I graduated, we didn't do any mm -hmm. of this. And I remember being assessed, going under the career assessments at Barnum um, College. Mm -hmm. I always tell the, uh, the eighth graders that I teach, I say, my s two sisters, they were straight A students, and they were handed a a high school schedule that was college prep, and I wasn't. 
<laughs> Why did you have bio chemistry and I never had? And I never asked. My dad was a teacher. Yeah, so I'm kind of social butterfly. We all have. Yeah. <laughs> but that's what's really cool about the yeah. site is it's mm -hmm. not it's not four year, it's not eight year, it's like what are you interested in? Yeah. You know what I mean? And so it really does cater to like every single kid's desires. Mm -hmm. And it and it the way that we've framed it, I think it we we promote that. You know what I mean? It's not about college. It's about what you want to do and how we help you get there. So. so what we need is the approval of the plan, which is This is the presentation that I had uh, for the last uh, regular board meeting. Um, so I'll just jump right in. I haven't updated anything or changed anything since then. This is uh, what we had at that time. And, and previously, um, I think I mentioned this to Katie after the meeting, um, in prior years, uh, the preliminary budget, there's whatever discussion has been happening throughout the year. Uh, and then in June, it's would have gotten the expenditures compared to the current budget, the proposed budget, you got the revenues, current budget, proposed budget, and just some discussion. So I thought, well, maybe I can get into it and explain it a little better and explain how it how it works. Uh, so that's where this came from. And obviously it's a something that's evolving all the time. So budget process. The purpose of the preliminary budget, uh, which as a reminder, you did approve a number and that allowed us to continue in the process. But we did say that we're going to talk about wages uh, specifically, and so that's not uh, set in stone here. That's not approved. But that is part of the purpose of a preliminary budget, is to get into the wages. What should the wages be for the upcoming year? Uh, additionally, as I mentioned the last uh, meeting, we have to have a uh, preliminary budget approved prior to having our budget hearing uh, in September, which is uh, more detailed. It's published in the paper, uh, and we can do that every year as well. So some variables to, to consider. Uh, we're in the budgeting year of the state biennium, so we don't know for sure what our revenue limit state aid amounts will be for the next two years. Last year we were ahead of the game a little bit because we knew it was the second year. Uh, so this year we're still waiting. Uh, last I saw uh, was an update from the 26th of June, so the, the week before uh, the 4th. Uh, so we're still waiting for more definitive information. I'll touch on this again in a minute. Um, but it definitely for us, it impacts our revenues. Uh, we levy to the full extent we're, we're able to. Uh, so if they increase the revenue limit, we can levy more. Uh, if they increase the aid with that, we don't have to levy as much, but we still get more revenue. Uh, the other factor that they uh, determine is per pupil aid, which is becoming a bigger factor of our revenue uh, every year. Student membership, for us, that's a we have talked about this every year. It is a big factor for us. Right now, we've been slowly decreasing in student membership. Until 1617, we increased about 1%. And so we're kind of in this position where, uh, within the revenue limit formula, um, uh, you'll see later on, I have one of the assumptions that we'll grow again at 1%, which is the practice that we've had here, where I do what we did the prior year. We haven't had a demographic study and we don't have a huge change, so that's fairly conservative just to continue with whatever has happened. Um, but based on the, on the membership formula, on the revenue limit formula, 1% uh, increase, we actually uh, don't increase that much. Um, 
our, our aid will, or our revenue limit will go up a little bit until, you, until we get down much lower. And if we uh, increase more than that, we'll go down a little bit until we get higher again. And so it's, uh, I think I've gone through this before where it's kind of convoluted, but that's based on the fact that we've been going down and now we just kind of started going up. And so our three year averages, um, it's going, hopefully it's going up a little bit. Uh, expenditure data will improve. Uh, we still have to present the strategic plan uh, to the court committee, but that will define priorities. Uh, there may be things that come out of that saying, you know, year one, we didn't budget for this, but here's some things we really want to talk about uh, year one or, 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 or so on. Uh, contracted services, um, there's still one outstanding uh, where the terms of the agreement are negotiated. Uh, and so I, incre I included a percentage, um, and it, it, it'll likely be very close to that. Uh, Transportation, we have some routing right now that looks like we'll be reducing uh, at least some JK routes. Um, so that is a cost savings. Special ed, we have to get into that more. Uh, Shannon and I have a meeting, I think next week, sorry, uh, to kind of delve into this and, and get Abby uh, on board. Uh, this year again, placement was less than expected. Um, and next year, it's probably looking the same. Uh, all that being said, uh, probably the amount we have to fill in from Fund 10, the overall expenditure in Fund 27, special ed fund, is probably not as high as the placeholder I have now, but that remains to be uh, filled in and determined. <coughs> Excuse me. Revenues. Mm -hmm. So again, as I mentioned, uh, we're assuming it's a variable of 1% growth uh, on the revenue limit sheet, the calculation. It calculates to a decrease of 62,000 from 1617. Again, that will vary slightly based on what the actual September student count is. Per pupil aid, this is the uh, categorical aid that's tied directly to revenue limit. This was created uh, after Act 10, um, and it's a growing component of uh, funds that districts can use. Uh, it's tied directly to your revenue limit membership, and it's not within the revenue limit. So it's just another revenue. Um, and this is what this is the tool that the legislature has been using to increase aid rather than uh, increase on the revenue limit formula. So there's three uh, at the time when I created this, there were three possibilities. I uh, created this budget using the governor's budget, which is the, the highest amount, an uh, increase of two hundred dollars per member for seventeen eighteen and two hundred four for eighteen nineteen, uh, and that's the net increase three hundred thousand for uh, this first year. Um, that was based within the governor's budget on the state using a self-funded insurance plan. Uh, the governor was saying that will save I don't know, $60 million. And so removing that, the calculation then decreased it to 188 and 180. And you can see it's a decrease uh, to 289. And then there's an assembly budget proposal where they said, how about 150 and 200 instead of 200 and 204? And you can see that goes from 308 to 231. Now, on the 26th, like I said, the last uh, update that I saw uh, was that they had come to an agreement, uh, in theory, where they would be able to uh, go with the governor's original proposal uh, and also increase aid so that they wouldn't, so there wouldn't be any changes in, uh, in property uh, in tax levy, uh, which is a big, it's a big factor, obviously, for the legislature. They don't want to increase uh, taxes. But, that being said, it was a positive uh, development, but that being said, there is still a big issue uh, with transportation in the state budget. Uh, I think the Senate or the Assembly, I remember which one was uh, discussing creating their own budget. So we don't know yet, and we're still waiting for them to address it. Yeah. yeah. What is the deal with, the, I'm not understanding, the state self-insurance plan elimination? So, okay, so uh, the governor's budget said we will increase the per pupil aid, which is money that the state gives the districts based on uh, the FTE in the district, uh, by 200 in 1718 per member, and by 204 uh, in 1819. And he said, we're gonna do this because we're gonna have increased uh, tax collections as a state, and we're gonna save this money, and a number of other things, we're gonna save this money because we're gonna go uh, for all state employees to a state self-insurance plan. And he says, that's the end they haven't done. No, and it was eliminated. Yeah. So it was eliminated from the budget. And so the governor was saying, 
for $60 million of the funding that's needed to get this 200 and 204 is directly coming from the $60 million we're saving from going to the state insurance. So that was eliminated. So that's why I threw in that middle one, because that's the calculation you lose uh, you know, $12 the first year per member for every district. So that being said, since this time, like I said, there's been the update where, okay, they have a consensus that, yeah, they want to do the 200 and 204, and now it's just hopefully working out the details. But like I said, also, it's kind of sticky because they have a big issue with transportation. So graphically, this is hard to see. <clears throat> this is a tax levy, and the red, <laughs> the red is the preliminary budget, and the blue uh, is 1617. So you can see, very similar. This is open enrollment. We're saying uh, revenue is going up. Revenue from local sources, is that what you're wondering? Sorry, so the bottom, the bottom is uh, tax levy. The second one up again is open enrollment, and the biggest one, uh, state aid. And that actually is decreasing uh, because of our membership decreasing. Um, the general aid, the biggest amount of aid, aid, but it's being made up with this per pupil aid decrease. It's almost, um, almost exactly the same amount actually being made up. And you can see it here in chart form. So again, um, this year's budget, next year's budget. What comes in in the 900s and other revenues? Um, things that don't aren't required to be placed elsewhere. This year, uh, the big budget uh, amount that was higher than normal was E-rate. E-rate gets placed there. And even though the fair amount of that is for last year's work, or I'm sorry, 15, 16 work, you, you record it in the year you receive it. So we received it in 16, 17. Expenditures. So again, uh, as has been discussed, um, the teacher FTE is increasing 1.5. There was the unfilled position uh, that you said, Phil, uh, that, that wasn't filled in 1617. And there was the increase uh, at the elementary school of half of <coughs> FTE. Um, as I mentioned before, we're going to update this as we go. More information uh, is yet to come. Uh, detailed budget, the budget hearing, and published in the paper. Uh, and the wage increase, um, so clearly, as you know, uh, the greatest percentage of district expenditures is, is for employees. Uh, in our case, we're not necessarily as high as other districts in the area because we contract out some things that, that have big employee costs like food service and transportation. Uh, but nonetheless, it's still the biggest factor for us as well. Uh, it's based on the uh, continuation of the teacher compensation plan. And so built into this budget, into the expenditure budget, is uh, continuing the teacher compensation plan and then a percentage increase based on that plan for all other staff, um, which is what we did last year. This would be the second year uh, of compensation plan if we are to continue it. So this is what it looks like, uh, just in structure. Um, it's, very similar to a salary schedule as far as how it uh, operates over time. Starting wage, 41706. Uh, and then you see the maximum wages at the bottom of each column for however many credits you have. Uh, as you increase 12 credits, you increase $1,000. Uh, as long as you're moving within, the, within these numbers here, so between 41706 and uh, $1,600 less than $57,590 with uh, zero credits, you're getting $1,600 uh, in a given year as long as you're not on an improvement plan. And so you can move across and your max wage is higher uh, as you move uh, and get more credits and get a master's. Uh, and as long as you're not at the max wage, you receive that wage increase. If you're at the max wage, you receive a stipend, $800. And it's, not base building, whereas everything else within the plan is base building. Uh, and this is taken from a memo that I sent out 
uh, last year, the teachers uh, kind of explaining the whole thing. This is just the, with the graphic from it. And so uh, it mentions at the bottom, uh, distinguished rating. If you receive that in your third year uh, for distinguished rating, uh, you get an additional $1,000 uh, on top of whatever you received in there. Uh, and that's not uh, limited or restricted by if you happen to be at the max weight. So if you're at the max, you typically get a seven or 800. But if you get a four, you get an additional 1,000. That's on your base. And that's going forward. So this is the compensation plan for teachers. Last year, uh, we used this to determine percentage increase for all other employees. Uh, this year, I did the same, and that's what the expenditure number is based on. And I'll probably I'll come back to that, too, just to illustrate that. You can see on the far left, uh, salaries, again, red uh, is preliminary 1718. Uh, blue is current budget, uh, so salaries, then benefits, then purchase services, um, non-capital objects, supplies, uh, and transfers are the one at the end that's higher up. Uh, the third one from the left, uh, that also includes open enrollment, um, which is going up, uh, this, uh, out the same as in, both are going up. And here it is in chart form. Again, current budget with preliminary budget. Uh, here it is by function, summary function you get um, uh, on a monthly basis. Uh, it broken down by fun well, you get it broken down by function and object. But um, here is just this is just instruction. So next year, cost of instruction is going up a bit. Support services about the same. Uh, and then this mainly is open enrollment uh, going up a little bit. And that, I mean, that's all sort. That's all kinds of tuitions. So, um, open enrollment is the biggest tuition. Here it is in chart form. So the preliminary deficit uh, is projected at 126, 636. Again, recognizing there's factors yet to address. There's revenue factors from the legislature. There's factors based on um, further information to be determined with special ed fund, uh, among other things already approved the preliminary budget so I'll just go up here at obviously excluding uh, the wage discussion which is included in this I'll just mention uh, the two percent was calculated based on teachers who uh, were here in 16 17 will be here in 17 18 uh, the, the change that they see on average. So we took, I took um, the, anybody who, anybody who moved, like the people who are, we know are coming in who are new, they're in the budget, but I didn't include them to calculate the percentage. People who left, I didn't include them to calculate the percentage. So anybody that moved, uh, and also people the max wage, uh, they ate $800 versus their, their base. Now if I was to exclude people, uh, teachers who are getting the stipend, and therefore their base isn't changing, um, it's closer to a 3% uh, increase. And obviously it changes if you are, you know, 41,706, 1,600 is a bigger percentage than if you're uh, $1,600 less than 70,000. So, or, you know, 69,000. So that's where the 2% came from. That's the same methodology that was used last year, which is why I used it this year. Any questions? Thank you. In the part of this, um, the next item, the wage discussion, um, is kind of built into this. Uh, if you want to move on, you can. Sure. This will be, be pretty brief. Is essentially, I, I gave you a very brief rundown of the methodology for the for the percentage. Uh, and I outlined the compensation plan for teachers. So uh, the information that I need uh, and that Mark wanted me to ask of you is what information do you need, what do you need me to come back with to have a good wage discussion? I think that was pretty clear for me. 
Well, I think we talked about getting hiring a consultant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's in the works. Yeah, I mean, and so the question then is, um, and we certainly can. It's a matter of timing. Do you want to wait until that's done? Do you want to get this done and then do the wage study and use that going forward? That's the discussion you would want to have. Right. Based on timing. Mm -hmm. Right. And a wage study can take quite a bit of time and resources. And we need to have this ready for September. So you can. So I think the study is a great idea, but I would hate to see us hold up this process. Uh, the, the end of the line for us is the, is the end of October. That's when we have to set it down. So how long do you think it takes? Do you know? What would you study? Oh, thank okay. you. I mean, if it's, if it's wrapped part and parcel with the HR audit, it would probably take longer. If, if they break that out and say, we're just going to do a wage study and, and compare and contrast, uh, that yes. might be good. So are we talking two months, three months, six months? I, I see a lot. I mean, I, I can find you know, all of the state data that's reported to DPI. And we have tools to contrast and compare. Um, but you know, would a company look at Minnesota as well? Would they, what are they looking at? How detailed, how granular are they getting? And normally that's the board's decision mm -hmm. to make. So they'll have to come to us and say, what do you want your comparable school districts to be? What do you want to compare wages in your district against who are you competing with and for jobs? And um, I, it's going to, it, we don't have, uh, I think we're lacking some job descriptions. So they may need to see the job descriptions first before they do that's that true. comparison. Yeah. And so that's what I'm saying. In my head, it's a longer process than just a few months. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. So we have multiple categories of employees. Could you bring forward something that includes, uh, I guess, the category of employee and what the cost of a 2% wage increase would be for that? Would you like um, other percentages? Would you like increment? Some. I'd like to know if we've just lifted the wage scale so that people who are at the top can still get mm -hmm. something on their base. The cost of living for the teachers. Correct. Uh, plan. Correct. And for everybody. I don't, I don't know if you have different scales. For there, there's no other scale uh, being used. It has been since Act 10, just a percentage. So if you think of anything else that you'd like to have included, I'm sure you could contact Dave. Yeah, is this something, so uh, as far as when we have this discussion, uh, and then you know, getting me what you want to see by a certain timeline, uh, is, if you want to discuss now or, or let me know, um, obviously I need a little time to put the information together once I know what you want. Um, do you want to increment of half a percentage, up and down, you know, that kind of thing. What, do you, what exactly are you looking for? Um, I'll bring that to, you know, whatever forum. Do you guys want to see 1.5, 2, and 2.5? I mean, I don't think we're going to be able to be extravagant beyond that. But. Add it to what? I mean, are we talking about a base lift or are we talking? Um, I'd like to see a base lift. Study, I would like to see comparables that include the Twin Cities. You can see, um, you know, there's, it's very competitive over there, and the pool is getting kind of thin over here. So, what are we're going to have to figure out, you know, some strategies in attracting and keeping good help here? There is some um, one thing, though, even though they are at a t higher rate, I think if you talk to those that are working over there, and we've got some that live right here in our community. There's some pros and cons both ways too that factor in and are pretty significant in people making a decision to come here or to go there. Mm -hmm. So how do you place a value on that? What do you mean by that? What are you talking about? Um, the, Catherine Cranston would be a good example. You know, she stayed over there, but she's also looking forward to retiring <laughs> for the yeah. first time ever. Um, some of the articles that were in the St. Paul paper, pretty significant to me. It would be to me as a teacher or a staff person over there. There's some concerns for um, what is happening over there. So, well, and I, I think our HR audit will 
hopefully delve into that whole package because absolutely any employer you draw employees or lose employees based on multiple factors, mm -hmm. salary being one of them. And they usually count that in. They yeah. include the yeah. package as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Well, if you're doing comparables, you be, should be comparing to Somerset, not to the city schools anyway. Comparing to Somerset, Nerich, Mount Ziola, and Washington, or Stillwater? Well, yeah, comparable to us. Well, I think that's true. That Forest Lake, Alameda, Chicago, uh, you know, you could go down to Red Wing. I mean, there's there's a lot of comparables to us yeah. in, in the Twin Cities, and it's a small. Driving is nothing nowadays. That, you know, they drive a lot in an hour. And so people can live here, but still, you know, if you it would be interesting to see how we do stack up against our comparables, not, you know, Hill Murray. <laughs> but, so are so you good looking at the numbers, are you good looking at the numbers for a base lift of yeah. the entire grid? One, one and a half, two and two. I'm great with looking at those, but I, what I don't want to have happen is we still have to meet the budget this year. And I think as we move forward with the strategic plan and are getting the community to see more and become more involved, We'll have a much more successful or more likely ability to explain it and justify it than if we just say, okay, we want to see this happen now. So I'd like to have this year to be able to get more community involvement as it has been happening with the strategic plan. I'd love to have that information though over this year to be able to, to share that. So not necessarily to impact or to be plugged into this budget that's going to have to be pulled in place by October, but to be able to have a better plan moving forward that we can share. So are you saying that other than our teachers and the stipend that they receive from our compensation plan, you do not want any of our other employees to receive a wage increase? No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying what he has proposed is fine with me because we have a time frame right now and we're at the tail end of the budget planning process. Whereas if we utilize that information that you guys are wanting to see, over the next year to be able to plug that in. This is what it would mean to the budget. This is what it will mean to our tax players if we try to be more competitive, if I'm understanding you guys correctly. So you, so for 17, 18, you're saying you're supportive of a 2% increase and do not need to see any additional numbers? No, I, I would love to see those, but I don't want it to be a holdup for the budgeting process. Okay, but we have to approve Wage increases for 17, 18. So right now we're working with his that is close to two percent, and yep. I am fine with that. Okay. So, but I'm hearing other board members would like to see how a uh, 1.5 or 2.5 would impact what you're predicting for the budget. Is yeah. that accurate? But that's still work for the next year on the wage stuff. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Is that accurate? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you could bring that forward for August. Or with July, because our next meeting is next July or next it's Monday. July. Next July. One point five, two point five. In addition to this. Yes. Is that possible for uh, next Monday, Dave, or uh, would be uh, August fourteenth would be the next call session? Um. Yeah, I mean, I need it for for Monday. See if it goes out Friday or not. But, I mean, you know the structure, so yes. you know what's happening. There's also a lot of prep time, so it's kind of random for that. It's a little bit. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I, I don't think we need to rush it, so mm -hmm. we need a little yeah. extra time, and it's fine. But what's the COLA that you're working with? I'm sorry? Is, what's the COLA number, the, um, mm -hmm. the number that the state tells us? Oh, the, the, so the ERC percentage? Yeah. That we're, yeah. Uh, we're not using that. No, do you know what it is? Just when you, it's always good to compare so that you know oh, yeah. when it's you're last I saw heading was, south. It was not. Uh, right. Thanks, Dave. Mm -hmm. You're up next also with right. the <laughs> resolution, so <laughs> don't sit down. <laughs> so. Or sorry, catch and move first. Catch and move.
So cash in lieu. Right now we uh, pay employees um, to not take health insurance and dental. Uh, this discussion is regarding health insurance um, with uh, health partners. This is the second year uh, of a two-year renewal after they came back with an RFP where they reduced our premiums by about 20%. They gave us a rate cap of 5% for the next each of the next two years. This is the second year of the rate cap. So in other words, the last year of our current agreement. Within that, within their underwriting, uh, they said you have to reduce uh, the amount you pay out to somebody to opt out of health insurance uh, to no more than 80% of the single plan. We have not done that. Uh, and historically, uh, that was something that was a something of a battle. Uh, we had discussions with health partners. Um, and so, long story short, this year they have said, uh, if you don't do that, we will not insure you for 17, 18. So, technically we have an option where we could say, all right, we're gonna go with the RFP for next year. However, because we agreed to the two years of rate cap, we have to pay 10% so 10% on um, 1.2 million. So, so we're not probably going to want to choose that option. That being said, we have three uh, employee groups that get an opt-out amount. Um, teachers, supervisors, support staff, and administrators. Uh, and they're all have different opt-out amounts that they receive. Uh, teachers have been set at the cost, the full cost of the single plan, which in 16-17 was 51.85. Supervisory support staff have been locked in at 5,845, and admin at $10,000. Now, Dave, okay, what'd you say? That's surprising. 58.45. And district-wide, between those three groups, uh, we're looking at about uh, 30 to 35 people. Employees on average opting out. Uh, up, up, I say up to 40 uh, sometimes. One of the requirements we have uh, is that if you're opting out, you have to have, you have to give proof that you have insurance somewhere. So historically, we've said, uh, and I think most of should say, we like to offer opt out because then paying that amount is less than paying the premiums uh, if, if they were to choose uh, insurance premiums. And HSA and HRA contribution. So for the district, it, it's a cost saver. We don't necessarily want to lower, though, what we pay because we would say it's more likely people would come back on and say, you know, I'm on my spouse's plan, and it costs more, premiums cost more, but the opt-out amount makes it worthwhile. So if we lower it, we would just say, you know what, Somerset's plan is better, let's go back on that one. That is, at the same time, exactly what Health Partners wants to happen. They want people uh, on the plan paying premiums. Uh, they say that there's um, they say there's a selection risk where healthy people will opt out. I don't necessarily buy that because we require them to have alternate insurance anyway. So they're still covered. Uh, but that's beside the point. So uh, the 80% are single for next year, 4,356. So the difference uh, for teachers, that's $830 less. For supervisor sports staff, that's $1489 less. And for admin, that's $5644 less. So Dave, what um, what rate is the supervisory support staff? I'm that was just locked in as a set, a set amount. A certain dollar amount, it's not a uh, single. I believe that was the 2012-13 cost of the single plan. At, at that point in time, There's it was set. Staff there. Yeah. And that, so supervisors for staff and teachers are in the handbook, and that's where these are set. And it's in handbook. Uh, admin, it's in contract. It's in contract language. So that is the other, that's the other part of this, is that if you want to change admin, you will have to uh, open contracts or do a memorandum uh, with admin. Because it's contract, obviously, uh, is different than uh, handbook language. So, 
that's something you'll need to discuss. Uh, probably with Mark's here. I'm giving you the info. <laughs> I mean, who's help partners to tell us to do that, though? What benefits you offer? It just seems to again, again, they want more premiums. They want more people paying premiums. Um, I did, I do have some survey information. Um, there's not a lot of districts out of the 20, 25 districts that responded. Uh, we pay more than 80% uh, of single premium. Uh, but at the same time, almost all of these, and I think, I think in fact all of them, uh, I'd have to double check, but it, it's, it would be very few, uh, have premiums as low as we have. We have very low premiums. Uh, and in fact, uh, health partners, when we do uh, claims review, uh, they're at a negative loss ratio because they probably underbid us. They, they went a little too low. When we, we say, we talk to them and they say, you're running at 108% of, of premiums received, i.e. our medical costs that they pay out uh, is 108% of what they take in a premium. Uh, they're kind of framing it like, that's not great. You're not doing well. But at the same time, you say, well, how do we compare to other school districts? And they say, we're really good. <laughs> Our premiums are very low. Uh, and so, not that we would consider it, but even if we were to go to RFP, we couldn't come back with the premiums that were locked in at for 17, it would be higher. With that cap, though, that can change dramatically over this next year. Or this next yeah, this year. is the last year that's locked in. Yeah. So, so again, this is a big year for what actually happens. I mean, they do look back a little bit over time. They, they, in my experience doing this a couple of times, they, they focus a lot on, on the current year. What, what's currently happening as far as your, your loss or medical costs are. So who are these other districts going with that our premium is favorable now? And I, I don't doubt that health partners will be bumping it right up there to what the entities are at. I didn't print that out, but I can get it. It is, there's a lot of CISA 11, there's some CISA 10 and 12 in here, I believe. Um, so there's a number of health partners, uh, there's Security Health, there's a Blue Cross, uh, there's a number of different uh, under it, uh, carriers. But, you know, at the same time, the structure of our plan, we do uh, have a high deductible. Uh, we stack an HSA and an HRA. We can have kind of a unique plan. Um, and it helps us get a very low premium. And I've seen this data before too. Uh, I can't remember if it's 15, 16, or the year prior. But we, as far as premium goes, uh, we're very low statewide. But again, uh, that's kind of off topic a little bit. Is there any additional data or info you'd like from me about uh, cash in loop? So does every district have cash in lieu? No. That, no. no. So we're unique to that? I don't want to you know, estimate what percentage statewide, but... Um, I know they were pulling away from it most districts. You know, I, I got, we got a decent response just from our CSA and a couple other districts where, like I said, you know, 20, 25 districts that responded to the survey do it. So it's not... Um, I, I, I'd say it's probably under half statewide, but um, it is a tool that districts use. How about in the middle border? Middle border, I know the Richmond doesn't. Uh, and Hudson, I don't believe, does, correct? I don't believe so. So uh, it's not as common right here. Take where Falls does. Take where Central does. that certainly impacts potentially a wage discussion, mm -hmm. um, given the impact that it will have on some of our Actually, yes, actual. Can you, talk, can you um, share with us how many people are in each of the categories? Uh, I think the supervisor supports that, and it's small enough that it might be identifiable. 
request, I can get you that information. Anything else? All right. The next item on our agenda is the appeal resolution to alter school district boundaries. Also, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't you glad we put them all together? I <laughs> <laughs> should give Mark's pages for two. <laughs> so, uh, did, did Mark send to all of you the email from Trevor? Yes. Okay. So, Trevor said um, to discuss the topic in open session, but not his uh, opinion necessarily or his perspective. Um, what background can I give you that you, that you don't have at this point? Well, I, I, for me, the question that comes up for this is how many, I mean, how many islands are there? And if so, could this happen to every single island? In our school district? Yeah. <laughs> so, so then that's what, do we know how many we have? If you'll give me a second, I can grab a map. Right? Well, then once you have one, it just, they can keep moving our way. They, there's nothing to stop it. They can always go over us and go to state as this one did. Is it possible for us to work out something? Our neighboring district. Not in place of the people. You, know, you, you can talk about it with your district, but it isn't going to carry weight. Well, I think, I think initially you'd have to talk to a landowner. Yep. You know, that's, that's the driving force. And then, and then if you had agreement, which I, I don't know that is necessarily guaranteed among different landowners. It obviously isn't. We've already yeah. seen that play out. <laughs> right. So at that point, then the board. Well, I just look at, look for us, Cook Drive. I mean, Nurch and Somerset. I mean, there's a house on the other side of the bridge um, down in the gravel pit. That's a Somerset school district. There's nobody else around there. That's uh, Mark and Jody Olson. Their house is Somerset. And they didn't even know it was Somerset. The kids went to school in Nurture for years. <laughs> so, I mean, we have all these islands. It seems to me it would be important for us to have an inventory. Of it, it, that it. is available by the county. You can get that. Well, I know, but it's, I, I think it would be important for us to see where these are and ask. We used to have them up right here. The maps used exactly, to but I would like to we, see We have them maps, and they'll be up there. I don't think we've ever really talked about them in depth. Yeah. I mean, Other than when it's, something comes up. Yeah. And, and there isn't a lot we can do about it, because they always have that right to let them. Well, how many times have you lost your fields in the past? Uh, I think that was the first. That was the first that we attended. We so lost one that we had. Yeah, there was one from the same channel. No, state one. There's our grandma. So, <laughs> thank you, Sharon. Thank you. Okay, point. This yellow dot <coughs> is the property that uh, we are considering a human. Uh -huh. And it's within this larger section of land. So, there's about 154 acres that would remain Somerset. That's three acres that would. And so you can see, I mean, there's islands everywhere. So that's part of the memo. I don't know if you were provided the memo that I, that I created, but I said that looking to the future, this landowner stated in open session, we, I bought the land knowing I was going to change it. He thought it would be easy. Um, that's not a good precedent for us just based on what our border looks like. There's a cost to the home, the landowner, to appeal it to the there's state. We've had, we've had ones that we have approved that we're trying to move to our district, yeah. and that chose not to invest that amount in appealing it to the state. So, I mean, this is a part of our state government process. We aren't going to be able to get away from it. Um, I think legal actions could become very costly very quickly, and. I personally would like to see it. I, I would rather see that amount invested in our district and in making our district a place that people want to 
come to us and ask to attach to our district. I'm involved at Pulaski too, but I would want to go and appeal this just to let it be known th these are our concerns. And yes, there's a cost associated with it, but there's a much larger cost if we do not. Is that property, do we know um, if their driveway is adjacent to the parts of the school district? So their driveway, uh, and again, have you seen the, the map? There's a driveway did, that uh, the road uh, is actually, the driveway has to go through Hudson. And so the, uh, the board at the appeal hearing through Hudson School District. Yes, the driveway goes through a bit, it goes from Somerset, crosses a bit of uh, Hudson before hitting the uh, old EE West. And so the, uh, the board said, well, that makes it contiguous because the driveway touches it. Whereas from my perspective, the way he described it, um, he doesn't pay taxes on it. It wasn't this driveway. It sounds like an easement. So, to me, that's not necessarily uh, contiguous. Well, I, if, if we, I mean, I'm just a little surprised at the result that the board came back with, and um, appalled at some of their lack of reasoning that I thought. So I know that I would want to go forward. With, um, an appeal to this report. I do too, just to say. And I think too, we're not saying they can't go to Hudson. Right. <coughs> we're saying we'd rather not lose that property. Absolutely, they can still open and roll. It just, we don't want to keep losing property that way. Mm -hmm. I think once you start, it's, it's just a snowball effect. And if we don't really know how many you know, what these properties are and how much developers, what are they, you know, I mean, you look at uh, Somerset Township and there's quite a few properties that are Osceola School District. Right. Yes, right on the county line. And you start looking at some of these properties and if you, if we, if we don't have we want them. Right, I mean, it's we're just going to be easy prey. <laughs> and they're just going to be picked off one by one. And I know towns feel that way too when cities start to. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like it's a very, I believe it's a similar situation. Well, it's that territorial yeah. control. I mean, once that extraterritorial control starts taking effect, you lose your voice. And it's happening. It's, it's you know, as soon as the Richmond hits 10,000, they get to go out five miles. That takes all of Starkway right Township. What are they at right now? 90. I think we need to understand this a little better and to have a separate meeting on this. We don't have, we don't have time. If we want to appeal, it has well, to be done one. by July 12th. Yeah, but we can appeal this one. I would agree with that too. But then after that, we need to understand this better. Um, the process? Yes. And the ramifications. I'd like to see more on this and why certain things happen and why this, this particular one happened the way it did. There's actually been two that have gone this way too. Yeah. Holton one did too. Holton one did too. Yeah. And we were led to believe, as a board and administrative team, that the state would support because they didn't want to keep creating more islands. Right. And then the very next time that it was tested, <laughs> it didn't go the way the when state had said. Was that two years ago? Let me think here. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was in 2012. So more recent. So yes. we, there's concern that yes. we'll keep doing it unless we right. Oh. right. We we don't understand the final thing, and you're right. It's going to keep happening. Yeah. And unless we question, I think, how are they making those decisions They're now? Standard. What what do we have to? Yeah, it's going to you know, keep happening. How can we function? I agree. There's a I mean there's a statutory test. There should be. They have to follow, and that's what we presented our argument based on. Right. Um, and why I said it, of course I didn't want to offend that couple that night, those two families, but because of what is statutorily, uh, what we can do, and I don't want to see us shrink anymore. It sounds, um, again, it, it seems like they have 
<clears throat> whether or not it may seem uh, arbitrary to us, it does seem arbitrary to me, and certainly I haven't gone through it, yeah. um, it sounds like they had a lot of discretion to say, well, that's the interest of the family. You know, Possibly, or it's never been tested, one of the two. And so do our circuit judges. <laughs> well, that's, and that's the other thing. I mean, you know, on the, Mark and I talked about that as well. You know, what, had, had this been, you know, three people from DPI, three consultants, rather than you know, three board members from across the state, come down on a Monday afternoon, um, would we have gotten a different result? Probably. Possibly. So do you need, we need a motion this evening because if we want to do that. So I would make a motion to move ahead with the appeal. Can we? We have to because action has to be taken before the 12th. So Marie has made a motion to move forward. I'll second that. Thank you, Brian. Further discussion? I have a question because we're in the work session. And I didn't notice it as a business item. Then we would have to have another meeting. Uh, what is today? What's the date today? today is That's on, it's on, due on Wednesday. So we'd have to have another meeting 24 hours as opposed to this evening to have another meeting tomorrow night. Can we just get into um, I think I have the authority to authorize it. Okay. I'm not sure. I'm not comfortable with doing the business item, but I am comfortable with saying we talked about it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So then whatever makes it. So can I just say that consensus then, Brian, you're comfortable moving forward? Yes. Are you yeah, comfortable moving yes. forward with the appeal? Yes. So then I can amend my motion if, if we can do this motion this evening. Well, technically we didn't notice this as a, I mean, it's not even listed as an action. But we can still have that motion in the minutes, it's just whether we can take action on it or not is what we're trying to find out legally. And if we cannot, then it can be what you're saying, if you have the authority to. And if she does not, then I would request that we have the meeting in 24 hours. <laughs> How would you like me to note that? <laughs> so I have your motion. Yeah. I have Brian seconding. And so we would that need the to consensus take of the board is that for moving forward. But now we will rescind the motion. No. No. Nope. Consensus of the board is moving forward after validating or verifying that we can based on that motion. Any other questions for Dave? Thanks, Dave, for mm -hmm. pulling that. Thank you very much. Show for us. Thanks, Shannon, for bringing in that bag. Oh. <laughs> we could just put it. That in helps me a lot, actually. Mm -hmm. We we have one for here, Marie. It's just now we have to put a sticky note on. It. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Had to do that at the All right. Time. Too. Okay. Um, so, we are on to item number six, the pupil non-discriminatory report. Um, okay, I think Tasia linked this report in here. We yes. it. Um, so, this is really just informational. Um, every five years, DPI requires districts to go through what's called a pupil non-discrimination and equality of education opportunity report. Um, so, in the last couple weeks, John, Jenna, Katie, and I kind of pulled this together and I would say John, Jenna, and Katie did 99% of this. Um, and actually when I was reading the description of what information we had pulled for this, I was kind of doing a panic moment of like, do you even have this information? And they're like, oh, yeah, we got it, no big deal. Um, so it didn't take too long to put together, but basically the, the intent is to kind of go through and do some self-assessment regarding, um, it's kind of on page two, there's a little bit of a description here, but um, Looking at methods, practices, curriculum, and such within our counseling department, um, including assessment and testing, looking at participation trends um, within our district um, activities, and looking at trends and patterns within our 
scholarships and awards just essentially to make sure that we are um, fostering an equitable education for all students within our system. Um, so we take a look at that information and once we have it all gathered and basically just kind of, you know, there's no perfect manual in terms of how you do this, but you kind of look through it, take a look at your data, again, take a look at your trends and patterns and see if there's anything real glaring, any big, big red flags um, within your data. Um, you know, so as you kind of look through there, you'll see the information that we gathered for each required section um, at the very end in terms of uh, recommendations. Um, I added two things at this point. Um, you know, if I did this five years from now, I might have some additional things in there, but given kind of what I know now, um, we don't really have necessarily a formal procedure for really analyzing data that we're taking in. We have the information, but this is really the first time that I would say that we really kind of formally taken a look at, okay, who exactly do we have coming out for our activities? Who are we giving scholarships to? What does that look like within our curriculum? Which kind of goes to some of that information that you requested not too long ago too. What kinds of things are being addressed in there regarding diversity? Um, and I think, you know, overall, we're doing really, really well. Are there some areas we can adjust and take a look at? Um, I think so, which is why, you know, over the course of the next year, um, I'd like to implement some sort of a system to really do further analyzing of that information and that data. Um, what that looks like, I don't know, standing here this very second, but um, hopefully a year from now we'll come back and report out some additional information there too. Um, and then I also put in here too, continuing to review our policies and our guidelines, uh, procedures and practices related to non-discrimination and equality. Um, I know administratively we're having a lot of discussions about that right now as well. Um, just looking district-wide across campus, what are some additional things that we can do to continue to address that? Because we know there's some gaps there right now. Um, so, uh, when this was all finished, I submitted it to DPI. Um, you know, got the thank you very much, check mark, looks good. Um, you know, really, DPI will not do a whole lot with this, you know, unless there was something massive of like, holy buckets, we need to drive up to Somerset right now. This is really more for internal dialogue within our district. So, um, questions about this, I'm happy to answer. Got John and Jenny here too, if there's anything that came up. So you're thinking of putting in place the practice of reviewing it to see if there's something that you might see or want to do something about. I'd like mm -hmm. that idea. Yeah, I think, you know, whether it's four times per year, you know, after every season, even you know. Once per year. Is right. Good. I mean, just, you know, something that, that we even haven't had a whole lot of dialogue about yeah. yet at this point, but just to keep this conversation ongoing so that it's not another five years before we're kind of looking at this and seeing where we're at. So um, I can keep the board updated, too, once we kind of decide what that might look like. But. Mm -hmm. For the number of participants, um, if a student participated in three sports, were they counted three times? Um, well, it's it's the number of participants as mentioned a couple times for the high school athletics and the high school activities. I think they are counted for each activity <coughs> for participation. Do you know? Yeah. I I think so. I think it's it just would you know make sense. But right. I think it's. You know, if I'm doing three sports, then I'm counted essentially three times because I'm participating in three separate things, is my understanding. But it might be interesting to know. Yeah. yeah. Could then actually mm -hmm. change the number of mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think it would be interesting to see do we truly have, you know, 40% or 20% of our students participating, or do we actually have 15% participating, so participating in multiple mm -hmm. things? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. um, so, as you're going forward and looking at how to analyze that data, I would love to see how many students we have in multiple, you know, three things, one thing, two yep. things, um, all activities, There's sports and activities, yeah. sports, um, any way that that data can be disaggregated. Yeah. Um, I appreciate that it was that you were able to pull it apart by male and female, and mm -hmm. um, this definitely gives us a glimpse of our participation. Mm -hmm. um, but I would be curious what truly our participation level is, because I know we have lots of kids who are in a lot of things. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, um, and, and we know that participating in things uh, helps kids grow their leadership skills and increase their academics and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Hey, for, for this particular, and we followed a couple of models, for this particular model, um, I did count uh, just how many of our students are actually engaged in activities and athletics. So they were counted once. That's once. If we're doing uh, uh, Office of Civil Rights uh, gender equity reports, we do count We do count uh, per sport. Uh, so an athlete participating in three sports would be counted three times. Uh, because there, there's three different, not, not for this okay. report. Um, 
Yeah, you were specific. 51 females or whatever. It right. Be that number. Right. Is according to the other models that we looked at in preparing this, there's how many of our students are actually involved in participating in extracurricular activities. So whether I do one sport uh, plus a couple of activities, I am one person who is engaged in extracurricular activities. Okay, thank you. And then Good. schools are using because the research, obviously, all research demonstrates that uh, the more kids are involved in extracurricular activities, the residual benefit of being better citizens, better students. Uh, so what are schools doing to really drive, even if a student decides to do one type of activity, what can they do to get a student involved in an extracurricular event? Uh, Office of Civil Rights, we're doing gender equity, they are counted multiple times because there are three other variables that help us prove that we're being uh, more uh, compliant with gender, with Title IX. Okay, that's good to know. That's why we have two play casts. <laughs> well, it, right, I think one thing that came up here too a couple times was just looking at a previous list that I had from, I don't know, maybe four or five years ago, um, just in terms of the activities offered and the things that, you know, John was able to add, you know, ski club at the middle school, robotics, I mean, just really trying to keep growing, you know, some of those things, so. Okay. Is there any other questions? Or? Don't sit down, Shannon. I'm yep, it's again, one more. <laughs> Perfect. Um, okay, so um, the Laude system. I, I would imagine we're probably going to have more conversation than just tonight, so I at least want to kind of get the conversation started, share with you what I know, my level of information regarding the system here. I was also able to gather some information from some other area school districts just in terms of what some other people are doing. Not super comprehensive at this point, but at least kind of getting the conversation started. And then at the end, maybe you can kind of let me know what else you'd like from me, and we can come back and produce some more information. But um, so I had Tasia link for you the two pages that I have regarding our lobby system here. Um, Jen is here as well, as well, and she was a part of those conversations when it was implemented, so um, she'll be a good good backup for me here too. But um, as I was going through the information and just looking at um, you know essentially the math behind it and what are some of the criteria and qualifications. Um, you know, previous to, you know, a couple weeks ago, I hadn't really dug into it that much because of my previous role. It was kind of, oh, we did a lot of system, that's great, you know. But as I started to dig into um, our system and then compare it with some other systems from some schools around us, um, Amory currently does it, Osceola's been doing it for multiple years, Think we're Central is bringing it on in the next year, um, you know, and starting to look at what is their criteria versus what is our criteria. And I would say one thing that I'm going to propose um, in terms of potentially making some edits, and um, you know, certainly you can let me know how you'd like to do this, but our list um, of courses is really, really small. Even just physically, if I compared it to, um, well here, it's really small writing, but you know, this is Amory. So you can see their list here is really extensive. Oh, wow. um, and ours is pretty short. You know, good, bad, and indifferent. Um, so I started really kind of digging into, so what are some of the classes that they use in terms of their point system, and what are some things that we're missing? Um, right off the bat, you know, we don't give any points currently for any classes taking in our business department. Um, we don't give any points for career and technical education. And one of the biggest <coughs> things is we don't give any points for music. Um, so those are three areas, and again, um, to let me know how you want to do this, whether it's through formal approval or whatever that looks like, but those are three areas that I would like to try to address immediately, even before we start this next school year. Um, you know, we have a, a PLC leader meeting with the high school next week. This is on our agenda. Um, you know, we need our PLC leaders to kind of re-look at this list and take a look at what are we missing, um, what do we maybe, you know, do we have to re-look at the points? I mean, just, we haven't had a whole lot of dialogue about it at this point yet. Um, but that was one big red flag for me, was that looking at all the other samples that I had, those were three areas that we don't have any representation and those other districts had multiple um, multiple classes available. So they did Amory? I'd love to see Amory. Yeah, yeah, and I can, you know what, and if it's easier, I can copy and scan it all to you. I I, like that. I said, at this point, I don't have a ton. Um, you know, but Osceola and Amory, right away, when I sent out an email last week, it just like, who else does this? What information do you have to share? You know, they shot me these things in two seconds. Um, Osceola really has a beautiful, and I'll send you this too, um, a parent brochure. 
Um, so parents understand it, parents know what it is. Um, it was two pages, it was super, I mean, I understood it in three seconds. Um, super easy to read, so I'll study that too. So I think those are all things that, I do, I think it'd be really nice. Yeah, I think those are all things that we can do. Um, you know, your initial email kind of prompted me to just ask some questions because I didn't know a whole lot about it. And I it didn't kind of went when it came time for that. My question arose when yeah. I saw Kate was invited to that honors dinner, but he didn't have a copy. I thought, okay, something in that, it doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. And so then when I asked him about it, he didn't really know either. And I thought, okay, there's my second red flag. Yeah. <laughs> if he doesn't understand it. Yeah. And, and not that he needed to have that recognition. He doesn't need it. He, what I want to have happen though from it is, are we really benefiting the kids that really, it's not the academics that helps them to excel. Right. Not, and we were also somehow giving twice the credit. They got the AP grade and they got the extra point. So they got that boost in the grade yeah. and they got that extra point because they took that class. So that was like a double plus for taking an AP class. And I thought that needs to be re-looked at, that's all. I, I yeah, appreciate I think, you digging it. Yep, I think we have some measures right now around all of this, you know, including with the celebration of excellence and these kinds of things that right now are in conflict with each other. Um, and we started having some of those conversations actually for school got out too. So um, so part of this is that analysis and you know, now that we've kind of went through a year of it, what's working, what's not working, getting this feedback. Um, you know, because again, this is one of those things where every single district that does this, it looks different. I mean, even Avery and Osceola, it looks completely different in terms of the mathematics behind it, and courses, and points, and things like that. So, um, I'm you know, I've been looking into it. That was my hope. Yeah, um, and I can, I'll scan you what I have so far, so you can just do your own comparisons and take a look at it if there's more information you want me to get. Um, I guess, like I said, my biggest question is, if for you, you know, if we make some of these changes, which I would like to do before we start this year, do you want me to write a memo? Do you want me to, I mean, like what? Is that a part of the student handbook? I think it should be. Yeah, I, <laughs> oh my I don't even know off the top of my head. Do you know I what an under handbook is? I think we put it in the Yeah, I think it is. I think it's a very simplified so version. So maybe you can lump that but all in. Yeah. There's one other motivator. When we had those bands here from the surrounding schools, the three other ones that were here, plus the two middle school ones, twice, if not three times the size of ours. Yeah. So let's not kill ourselves. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. There's a lot of other factors that contribute to that too, though. That it's not pretty... just our Laude system. Oh, no. Our... I, I do recognize that. I do recognize that, but yeah. that did not help it either. Sure. Yeah. So, you don't want an unintended consequence of you know, right. kids taking Correct. arts and things that they don't get yeah. you know, some level of points or whatever that looks like. So yeah. um, I guess at this point, if there's additional information you want me to gather, um, you know, like I said, this is an agenda item for our leadership team next week. We're going to talk about it, start looking at some of these individual classes. I think the other thing that I know has come up at the board level previous was kind of the Val and Sal piece of it, too. Um, I don't know getting stuff in. <laughs> yeah, you can do, I'll, I'll, I'll send it all to you. If you can do like a summary of what your recommendations are, sure. and what the, you all determine, yep. that would be so it's your night -time terrific. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, super easy. It's yeah, easier we'll do for that. me. That, and, and that I'm lumped in on, yeah. on a link to one of these agendas that's 500 pages long. Sure. Okay. Awesome. 500 Okay, you're not exaggerating, right? No. <laughs> um, of those districts, do the... Like I know Osceola still does valedictorian and salutatorian. Does Amory also? Um, they don't, and they're phasing, my understanding of Osceola's phasing it out. Many of the districts that even like St. Clair Central study, and we're gonna bring it on next year, we're getting rid of Val and Sal. Um, you know, we started doing some initial, just kind of surveying even some districts in the cities and things like that in terms of how do you do that? What does that look like? Um, you know, and again, this is kind of one of those things where you can do it 20 different ways. Um, you know, students vote on a speaker staff nominate. Um, I would say in the, the limited research I've done so far, most schools don't have this and a balance out. <coughs> so, but, you know, we can make it look however we want to make it look here. So. Well, I think if you make it more inclusive, that'll be a big thing with adding in some of them classes. Yeah. That's important. Well, and look at, you know, this year at graduation, you know, we had 43 students that graduated with some level of award under the system. I mean, that's great. It was great seeing all the color cords and, I mean, 
then we had I think 29 students graduate with honors and you know so that might be a bigger discussion you know that you guys have with the board and we can certainly give some input too um, but is it really um, cumbersome to have both a loud and a balanced salute? I don't know. I They're start. still calculating GPA for Yeah, it, it wouldn't be because, because it was Max is motivated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was. He's his mom openly said this. So I think and that goes a little bit. Sandy's came and talked about yeah. that also. Yeah. I think that goes a little bit to just philosophically who are we here? Because some of that is driven by GPA. Not all of this is driven by GPA. You know, those are those are two separate kind of conversations. So I think you know, and I know the balance out thing came up, you know, when this first was introduced yeah. as well in terms of kind of how people felt about that. So I mean, and that's it wouldn't impact the state scholarship. No. So no, that'll actually help. So I guess it's just a title, not a title. Okay. So maybe. Yeah. I hate to see it go with where academic scores are right now. The schools that are getting rid of it are very high achieving schools, that their problem is that kids are putting too much stress on themselves. Mm -hmm. That's not where we're sitting right now. I think we need that motivator for the kids that that does engage and motivate to really push themselves. I would like to see that opportunity to be engaged and motivated so available for our students. Mm -hmm. And I do know it works. Kate was in a great class like a group where they really did spur each other on mm -hmm. but I only heard of the four that actually that Val title was what they were focused on so sure. four out of 69 I don't know how many graduate yeah my my opinion I don't disagree with you I think my opinion is we only just finished year one yeah. we have tweaks and things to make we know that this is not a perfect system here yet you know, let's get through another year making some additional tweaks. We can bring that for you in August um, when I come back, and then we can, you know, kind of let that settle in for a year, you know, have another discussion. And so, but this was the last year about it, trying to solidify trying as far as the phase out, correct? I believe that to be true. So, if we wanted to keep it, I think going a year without it and then bringing it back would be yeah. mm -hmm. not effective for our community. Um, but we could phase it out at any point beyond that. And they can be parallel to each other. Um, so I personally would rather see us continue with both systems and keep a valedictorian and salutatorian and work out the kinks in our um, laude system. And someday if our problem is that kids are taking too many AP classes and are stressing them out too much, then we can look at removing the valedictorian and salutatorian. Well, I think for kids that are juniors, that their goal was to be valedictorian, and this year they did not have it. I think that kind of stinks. <laughs> that so. Yeah, I think I, for the next year, it certainly doesn't hurt. I mean, to to still have kind of the have them both kind of run at the same time. I mean, that's just my opinion, but. But can, couldn't we figure out a way to start it, really implementing it with their freshmen, that, that by the time they're seniors, this is. You know, because I mean, mm -hmm. there's some kids that <clears throat> yeah. have seen both, but if you kind of put a definitive line, this group of freshmen that are coming in will be the uh, yeah. lottery mm -hmm. system, then they know it and they can, mm -hmm. you know, work to getting a different color cord versus valedictorian and salutatorian. If they, they know it coming in, then it's not a shock. But otherwise, if you're, you know, a sophomore or junior and you're in the top of your class and they're like, oh, we're not doing it anymore, well, you know. That sucks. <laughs> and I mean, that could that could you know really be detrimental to a kid that is 100% focused on that recognition. So it's to me, I I do think if if we're going to get rid of it, then we need to do it either this year's freshmen or next year's eighth graders and have it set up so they know. Do we just have for two years? Can I say something? Oh, yeah. So the board approved to phase it out. Um, and the, so the phase out started with the class of 2018 when they were freshmen. Mm -hmm. um, so that was decided on. My personal opinion would be that that wasn't communicated very well to parents and to students. So that was a board decision, but it wasn't then taken on as a building and communicated well to students. Um, there are some students who are aware, you know, because they're in our office kind of fighting for that Val sale. So we've let them know that, you know, next year there wasn't going to this 
coming year there wasn't going to be a Valor Valor sale. Um, but I think they'd be very excited if it came back. I think there are some kids who. And when they're in there, they're still told they have the opportunity to get that top if they want to go to a state university. Yeah, absolutely. So, and mm -hmm. there's some of them are still motivated just to be number one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yep. Um, so and something the else in the Lottie system document, just to mention, um, and I'm definitely not getting defensive, but just information for you all. At the bottom of the document where it says dual and transcripted credits, the reason that, that bottom section is on there was to kind of keep the document simple. Um, what I'm hearing is it would be great to have it more detailed and kind of all the classes listed. So those dual and transcripted credits um, could be listed up there on the next section, which I think would be very helpful for people to see. It's a lot, it includes a lot of business classes and um, face classes. So the students get college credit and high school credit taking them in the high school building. So that's kind of meant to keep it simple, but we of course couldn't document all the youth options courses available because that would be like, you know, the UWRF, um, you know, all the classes that they offer. But, and there's a lot of online AP courses that we offer that could also be listed there. So students know exactly what they're shooting for. So I think the idea um, when the document was first created was to keep it simple so people could understand it, um, but I don't think I don't think that's been helpful. I think it, would be, <laughs> it would be more helpful to have it more detailed. Yeah. So I appreciate that feedback. Thank you. Classes, um, so we just got a letter from the U of M that Kelly Emerson will be able to teach another CIS class mm -hmm. starting this year, so it's exciting. Mm -hmm. That is one. Of, yes, exploring teaching. So that kind of falls into some of that ACP thing we do this so Just one thing in there. She's excited. Thank you. Very cool. So will the board vote on the, good question. Um, the Valentine Solutorian or? Not tonight. No. I guess that would say oh. that there was. Did, did we have general consensus? It sounds like we did. To go another couple of years, so maybe the same thing holds with that as what did the earlier one. <laughs> yeah. Well, so um, Shannon will be bringing forward the high school handbook, so I imagine that that would be yeah, part of the fair. handbook. Um, and, and there's not the urgency and time with that near like there was with the other. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I would be curious too, I know that there's a policy on graduation so I don't know if that impacts um, either the Laude system or the Laude kind of at all. All right. Um, next up is the All School Handbook. Are there any questions on that? I have a question on the tardiness. Um, there were some changes made. What's on page six of that handbook? So there's, it seems to be separated out, tardiness to class versus tardiness to school. Um, and there were changes made specifically to the tardiness to school, where we're giving them another five minutes <laughs> to not be considered tardy until 8.15 if they're here. If they arrive after 8.15 from 8.10, mm -hmm. but like the middle school starts at 7.55, so they don't count tardy if they come in 19 minutes late for first period. And do you know what the difference is? I'm not expect. Are they, I don't know whose changes these are. Yeah, um, I don't know for sure. Um, I just, you know, we had some discussion about the tardiness piece in general, and I can, I guess this may or may not be helpful, I can only speak for the high school part of it, that um, we wanted to move away from handing out a detention for each tardy and try to figure out, because we've learned over time that that's not impactful. Um, so trying to find a different way to address that other than detention, um, which is the part that I specifically wanted changed in here. Um, and looking at kind of what we put in here too about making an attendance plan. I, I don't know the 815 piece. Um, yeah, I don't even understand the 810. Yeah. 810 I don't even do a job. You, you need to be there at 
Right. You do. <laughs> and and so, isn't that why we have a bell? <laughs> yeah. It, it cool. just seems like there needs to be some consequence for Well, it. and I don't understand the difference between turning this to class versus turning this to school. Through all of the day, sometimes kids drag the right. problems mm -hmm. to get to the next class rather than just at the time. Tart all be under one thing. <laughs> you know. So if you're tar if you're tardy to a class, do you get detention or is that subjective to the teacher? Um, well, I saw that smile, John. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you can probably answer better than I can, but it says they'll be admitted in the class. Um, my guess is it is subjective. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say some so teachers, you know, it yeah. depends on the current policy. Our policies. Kind of or changers, you know, yeah. Right. So, is the goal of this change to address the tardiness problem, or is the goal to of give this fewer detentions? To give fewer detentions, yeah. Um, I can tell you from a high school perspective, um, looking at our detention data when kids as seniors are graduating with you know 80 hours of built up detention, we know that that is not making an impact on. The behavior of tardiness. So, I wanted to put something in there um, regarding, you know, if we have habitual tardiness, that we're putting together some sort of because there's a why behind that, right? Whatever that is, um, dishing out detentions did not appear to be um, impacting that behavior. So, looking at a more positive, proactive way to try to address that. Were they followed up on? What that? Were they followed up on? Did they ever have to serve them? I mean, how do you get 80 stacked up if you're not? If you're enforcing it and it's being served, I don't know how you'd get it stacked up. So to me, it sounds more like the ball got dropped and nobody was making them serve their detention. But I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Which would result in 80 stacked up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but. Well, I just, okay, if you, have, if you have multiple, I mean, was there multiple students that had large amounts? I mean, was this a senioritis problem was this you know I mean there's lots of reasons why kids are tardy so to me it's like if it's a culture thing what you know it's more of a what are your expectations of your students in your building right. <laughs> right. and do we have to adjust the time versus what your expectations are so right so the time I, I, I don't have a great answer for it because I'm frankly not sure okay. I don't know the other part of it like I said um, you know as part of addressing some cultural things, um, detentions by and large did not have an impact on students, mm -hmm. whether it was beginning of the day or throughout the day, getting to class on time. Yeah. So we need to address it differently. Um, so we have an admin meeting tomorrow morning. I can double check on the 815 piece of it. I just, I don't know. I don't want to tell you the wrong thing. No, and um, so I'd like to hear, you know, the reason. I just don't. I feel the same way she does. Yeah, I don't think you give them more time. It's right. Like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just don't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah we'll I, give you five more minutes. Yeah. I, I, I think no, every kid's gonna take that five more minutes. But I mean, I, there's everyone's gonna have a time where they're gonna have flat tire going to ditch. Oh, sure. yeah, I mean, that, that happens. Happen. But if you're just late because you don't get out of bed, now we have a whole different thing we need to talk about. And right. mm -hmm. then you know that there is a personal thing. Okay, why don't you get out of bed? And you know, let's change your habits mm -hmm. because. You know, next year when you're out in the adult world, you're not going to be able to stay employed. <laughs> you got to show up. So why don't I just double check and I yeah. can send all of you an email tomorrow? Mm -hmm. <laughs> just double. I just don't want to tell you the it wrong thing. Have, yeah, I, honestly, it doesn't have to be tomorrow. Well, that's okay. Because no, um, we'll we're it. not doing anything with this tonight, anyway. <laughs> we'll unless you want to get it off your desk. Mm -hmm. um, I'm excited to see the addition and. The harassment section too about the discriminatory yep. symbols. Yeah. Um, does our policy? I didn't click on it to see if our policy would need to be updated to address that. So I have a little insight on that. Um, you know, there's some rationale behind why we added this in particular. Um, in working with Trevor, he suggests that as a board, um, I'm not sure how much Mark shared with you, but as a board, um, that you address this particular topic and that particular policy to include some language that Trevor has some suggestions about um, to be able to um, address some of the issues that we ran into this year with some sure. um, some of those things. Um, 
So it, that puts the district in, in a better position in the unlikely event that you know something real significant would occur. Now we have it not only in our handbook, our all student handbook, um, I'm gonna put verbiage in there in the high school as well, um, but then we have policy behind it regarding kind of what that looks like. So um, I know Mark has that information from Trevor that um, I'll maybe remind him to share with you because I know Trevor wants to kind of get moving on it too, so. Good, perfect. Yep. Thank you. Any other questions about the all school handbook? Mm -hmm. All right, on to the extracurricular advisor and coaching handbook. Questions about that? I didn't get through it. Were there any significant any changes? Highlights? No, the current uh, the current version is in is completing its second year. Okay. Um, two years ago, there were there were uh, some s rather significant revisions of, of updating, and then um, a few policies that were uh, added that it just came about because of. Uh, Coach, uh, a coaching issue that we had had. Uh, main, main revisions uh, centered around uh, the use of social media and communicating uh, with kids. Uh, and then just some other minor updating uh, because I do not have knowledge of when the handbook was created. I, I think it may have been uh, maybe six, seven years prior to the revision two years ago. So there, there was just some important updating of semantics other things like that but long story short the current version is in, in second year and we have not uh, we have not encountered uh, any issues with the current language um, so acceptance of this handbook uh, next Monday um, I will be able to uh, start presenting the handbook uh, to our coaches this fall thank you um, one thing that if you could highlight it John on page 22 uh, the camps and clinics uh, running through community education. Uh, we haven't gotten to that point yet, but our youth camps and clinics are being posted on our community education page and that the money is all being paid to community ed and being monitored through that. Um, I'm still getting youth flyers for, for my children that uh, still uh, are confusing as to who's sponsoring it, which sure. organization, if it's the school district or not. Or and so there's been lots of improvement but the, I'm still getting notifications that it's unclear as to who's sponsoring the, the youth camp. Um, so if you could work, now that we um, have someone a little bit more dedicated to community education, um, I know when the New Richmond one comes and you see baseball and football and, and um, basketball and all those youth camps being uh, promoted that way, um, it's, it's a very, great way to get the information out to everyone in our community, not just our students. Um, and that way we know if it's not a separate organization that has a PO box and, and does their own tax forms and stuff, we know how the money's being handled. Okay, so you, you just want, uh, you're, you're requesting just more clarification on when our camps are being offered I just think it needs to be emphasized that if they if it's not being sponsored by an outside organization, it has to be run through our community education process. Sure. We still have flyers that go home that we're writing out checks to an organization that doesn't exist on a tax form, and that there's you know um, the contact is communicate or is confusing because it's school district either address or email. But then how other does, information. How does he know about it if he's not sending them out? So maybe you want to keep your flyers that you're getting so we would know what organizations to. Take I care. have been turning them in and sharing them. Um, I don't know if they've been getting to John or not. But but John's advising the coaches who are offering these okay. youth camps. Okay. So I'm just asking John to clarify. Unfortunately, it's only one sentence in here and it's a long document, so I'm sure it gets mm -hmm. overlooked. And it's an update in our process. Um, so if you could highlight that with the coaches so that we're um, utilizing the community education process um, to communicate. But with it's not, you're not saying that it's, it's a requirement that if a sport is running a camp, they have to do community. Yeah, I'm confused too because... So I know that there are community organizations that run their own youth camps that we just highlight by having a link on our website and they have their own tax exempt process and I know who I'm writing a check to that. 
However, we have youth organization or youth camps that are offered that are not a separate youth organization that has their own tax exempt form. They're just sending home a flyer and collecting some checks and, and using that to support their program. We can't funnel money that way. We need to run it through our community ed program so that that money is being documented. And, and that's, I mean, that's an important piece of this handbook. That was a big part of that discussion two years ago. Right. And there have been improvements in the last two years, but we need to continue to be very clear in that communication and how that money is being offered. Um, I, 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 just, you know, for example, there's a big fundraiser going on right now for Somerset football. You know, $40,000 is what I heard they're gonna make, but where does that money go? Does it go through Somerset community football? It, if so, what is it? Does it go through community education or is it part of our football program? I don't know. You know, you pay your money to get your, your lucky day, but you know, I don't know. And you know, people probably think it goes to the high school and it probably isn't. I don't, I mean, is it, is it not? Is it part of community ed education? Is it a separate organization? It's part of the Somerset Youth Football Program. So they have their own I-90 and all that there stuff. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, but it doesn't, you know, you don't know that when you look at this, or if you go to the website and you see the youth sports, you just think it's part of school. So we just need to clarify that in a little better. Can I ask a question from a coach's standpoint? Mm -hmm. So if we're running a camp, a little cheer camp, and we're doing it as a fundraiser, that's our one fundraiser that we do for cheer, then would that want to be ran through community ed? Or are we, because like right now then the money is coming to through the school, but like going in our fundraising account. Are you, am I being clear with my question? Like no, mm -hmm. the, the current distinguish, the current uh, item of uh, how we're distinguishing this is if, uh, and it gets in a little bit of WIA rules and, and what a school is sponsoring versus what a school is, is not sponsoring. So the organizations have used camps as a fundraiser um, but if they're doing that, then they have to follow the same procedures as if an outside group is coming in to use our facilities. Um, so if SBA is, is running a basketball camp, it's treated no different than if uh, UW River Falls coaches come up here and want to conduct a camp. They have to rent the facilities and any other expenses that are incurred with that if they're using it for a fundraiser for their, their group. Um, what Nancy is saying is, is, is correct, mm -hmm. that if our, our coaches are running a, a camp and they are uh, utilizing it uh, to increase their Fund 21 funds, uh, it truly should come in and be channeled through, through the district, so it's, it's monitored in that way. That's a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it actually is a very big deal that we yeah. need to ensure that we have consistent um, procedures and consistent communication. Um, you know, flyers that come home don't necessarily say that it's an SBA sponsored uh, camp or that it's a fundraiser camp or that it's, and so we just need to be, the communication that goes out needs to be very clear and the process for um, uh, paying for the facilities or not and, and uh, keeping track of the money needs to be transparent. I can totally understand though because it has not been happening that way all the time. Now we're starting to, where there's gotta be a learning curve time. Yeah, sure, oh, yeah, for sure, you know, for yeah. sure. To me there's still a little bit of confusion when somebody says, yeah, we're doing it. Yeah, that's part of the school district because community ed is a part of the school district. So there's still some, it can easily be misunderstood how it needs to function. Yeah. So. I, I think what we, we, we need to further talk about though too because community ed funds are uh, fund A is different than Fund 21. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be harder than for the programs, uh, cheer, uh, basketball, and other who are, are trying to bolster up their, their Fund 21 account so they have access to those money uh, as opposed to there, there's there's more policies and red tape that we have to follow if it's if it's a Fund 80 event. So, so I, I think, think we need to. That's what the goal of the committee who wrote this handbook was. I didn't write this language. I mean, it says right here, programs, camps, or clinics will be organized and run as a function of the community education programs. So we maybe want to rephrase that language 
to allow them to have their independent fundraisers. Yeah, is, is it possible to just really be more clear in distinguishing whether it's a uh, the event that's being sponsored by the school, whether it's a community ad opportunity or uh, football, basketball, cheer opportunity, Fun. Fund 21, that we're just clearly distinguishing whether it's a school-sponsored event versus a community club-sponsored event. Right. Is that, so that, club. is, is that is that more acceptable? So then that line at the bottom, page 22, would need to have some language change in it. So do you work with most of them? Of the SBA and youth football and track group? I, there's quite a few on that. The, my interaction is the the approach that they're taking, just clarifying uh, school versus club, and then therefore getting the facilities requested and, and paid for accordingly. So I mean, I'm, I'm looking at our youth sports. And, and, and there is a pretty consistent dialogue with the coaches and myself on um, how this is being presented. So and I appreciate Nancy's compliment on we, we're making yeah, improvements. We're making, progress. we're making yeah. progress on just mm -hmm. being more clear as to who is sponsoring this event mm -hmm. uh, and then making sure that the, the monies are handled accordingly. Well, I'm, I'm just looking at the, the youth on, on the website. So we got TRAF, youth baseball, youth, ba youth basketball, youth football, girls basketball, youth soccer, youth volleyball, youth track, and youth wrestling. So, I mean, I would imagine each one of those has funds coming through, so we should be really clear and concise on yeah. the money that's coming through and where it's going, yeah. whether it's going to mm -hmm. Fund 20 or, fun, or 120 or 80 or wherever. Yeah. But it should be clear because it is on our website, so it should be. Yeah, and I think that's, from my perspective, the, we, have, we, have used, we have used the school website as a way to help those community organizations um, kind of bring awareness to their things. And, mm -hmm. and so maybe that is part of the comment of it where. No, I think that's a good idea. We want community to feel like right, they are part right, of this. Uh -huh. Right. I don't, I don't want those, to But in those, in those links, then I think, well, you know, even the clubs need to be very clear that uh, this is. This is a community club well, opportunity right. as opposed to this is something being offered through our community education program. Yeah, I think it's two different things. It is. Yeah. It so is. that paragraph maybe needs to be reworded just to clarify there. Not everything needs to be funneled through community ed. We want the community to do things like this and not have to go through the school district for everything. But we don't want it to be misleading that it is being chaperoned or sponsored by the school when it is not. It's being sponsored specifically for youth football or well, I think, sport. Well, I think it, the part of it is it's confusing to parents because part of this is that most of the coaches are, are employees. So the things are coming back to school, so as a parent, you just assume okay. that it's a school function. So the language in our youth program, you know, However it is, whether, you know, that's a collaboration somewhere else, that it's just the language needs to be cleared up because it gives the impression if I send $20 from a letter that I get from a teacher about, I think it's going to the school. I don't, you know, I mean, I don't think it's going anywhere else. I just assume it's going to the school. So you assume that that money is being processed through the school district and all that there. So that's. It's, it's just a perception thing. It's just figuring out the process. So it's cleaning up the process. That's all it well, is. Well, help me understand something, though, because we did through soccer, we did that through uh, maybe band two. Help me understand what the concern is, because are we questioning whether or not those funds are actually being used for what they're saying they're using them for? No, 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 no. Yes. I can oh. show you checks that are uh, stamped on the back that were not deposited by the Somerset School District. Okay, but that were written went, out to what but, appeared to be a Somerset School District sponsored thing. But it went to that, what it was written out for? It went to that organization? It went to I have no organization? idea because it's a weird stamp. Well, and quite frankly, we've had plenty of cases in our office yeah. where those um, bugs are not audited. And so those funds have been stolen. Yeah. Um, oh. So, as a 
school, we should so be clear to people you know, who are using our facilities for so it's more an accountability yeah. for where they are. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I mean, what I'm reading in the fundraising here is that there must be something that has to be filled out and approved ahead of time, including exactly what you're fundraising for. Right. Um, you know, if it's a fundraiser for the school district, I think whatever goes home about that should say that and should even include what the fundraiser is being used for. Yeah, our you know, Fund 21 I mean, audits now uh, have to include. Uh, just a statement of uh, the cheers doing uh, fan fan clothes uh, fundraiser an, est an estimate of the amount of money they're uh, hoping to raise and 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 what possible things um, will that money be useful you now coming back in an audit did they buy cheer mats with this that's not uh, that's not the point but uh, our fund 21 accounts do state actual fundraising event selling whatever um, amount of money that we hope to raise and possible intent of uh, those funds so that that has been over the last couple of years um, our, our fund 21 records are really specific now. which is great yeah that's what yeah. it's supposed to be but it's it's just it's just a nice target for us too that this is this is what we're doing this is why we're doing it and then when we accomplish those things those are uh, that's positive and it's also a way to broadcast it hey you guys ready to yeah. go yeah. got this one mm -hmm. well we've had, we've had specific instances where um, there, there, there's a lot of door knocking and mm -hmm. uh, but when when people actually hear something that you know we need they're like oh yeah that's awesome. Want to, want to contribute specific to that. Needs, yeah. So going out there with a specific need with the fundraising is much more effective than just going out there fundraising. So John, can you bring forward um, a recommendation to update the handbook to clarify okay. the difference between fundraising um, and my my printed media? copy is not jiving with what oh, you're seeing okay. on the screen. So oh. I've I've been lost here in trying to find the specific. <laughs> Uh, I have fundraising procedures. Um, my, that's page 11 for me. Communicating expectations yep. for summer involvement training is where that little yeah. camp clinic. Yeah, it's a mm -hmm. summer camp thing. And what, is there some topics below that? Or that's the last one on the page. page the one 22. next one is school lower level programs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just above this is out of season is part of the out of season training advisor coaching page. Okay. Bigger, faster, stronger is the first one. And it's just the last line on that page. Oh, there we go. <clears throat> I got it. Then I have one more question for you, John. Last year we had talked about the follow up with the coaches and uh, did, did, how did that go for the year? You know that wrap up for that the evaluation of the coaches just specifically last year huh? yeah we had talked about that you were going to evaluate the coaches and yeah. i do a i do a, a preseason uh with the coach and then uh, also uh, we do a, a season in review uh, summary uh, in terms of the handbook there is a there's a formal coaching evaluation that it's been agreed upon that in a in a third year so we have uh, uh, coaches who will be doing like that. Okay, I guess a third year eval this year, okay. um, and then you know I think you know to be relevant and meaningful and, and it's practical. Um, that's part of a, that's part of a preseason visit. You know this is what we're looking at as we move through this year together. You know the coach and I or, or whoever. Um, there. Just been involved in dialogue with other districts and other athletic directors. There seems to be uh, kind of consistent communication on really finding a meaningful and relevant tool uh, to work with the coaches. I think the current tool is something that is, is modeled off of a current uh, educator effectiveness grid, uh, but I don't know that 
personally as, as, as someone who coached for many years. I, I don't know that this is the, 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 be, the best tool for working with coaches, but that's, I, I guess, my challenge to continue to work on that and possibly present some, uh, some new models or some new ideas on, on just what can be more meaningful for coaches as they're working with their kids. It's, it's the difference, for me, it's the difference between the, the art and the science. You know, the, the, the coaching handbook is, is great to keep everybody on the same policy page. Uh, the real art is, and especially with our people who are new to coaching, not necessarily young coaches, but new to coaching, is uh, just really working with them. And that's where I want to bring my experience on. Uh, how are we going to continue to make the meaningful connections with kids as a result of this opportunity of coaching? So that's when I look at these models, I see, you know, that that language is stated there, but that, that's, that's just bringing the art of how do we do that? And then, then, and then how can I determine that it's being done? You know, and, and that's like a, like a edu educational leader is having the time to, to be around that person when they're in practice, uh, working with kids. And that's, that's, a, that's a huge challenge with hours of the day and so many other things. But that's where I hope after three years, you know, that I can start to really be more effective and, and meaningful for our, for our coaches and our advisors who are doing great things with our kids beyond a shadow of a doubt. So I do, uh, coming back, Patty, uh, at the end of every season, I have a one-on-one -on -one and have a, have a short script if it's not part of this model of, of uh, things that we need to cover as a result of the season, whether it's just equipment inventory, but uh, the big thing, uh, big question I ask is, what can I do to help you be more effective with uh, your program and your kids? Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for John? John, just got, got one for you. Um, if, if you're not um, a staff person, as far as volunteers go, mm -hmm. you have to do, have a background. Yes. And what does that consist of? Our current uh, our current uh, clearance right now for uh, anyone coming in, even as a as a volunteer, uh, we get their date of birth, current address, and uh, Rod Hawkins is our our person who uh, completes a background check. Okay. So this is going on the web and doing a search yeah. to see if you have a record. I think, no, I, was just curious what, um, I, think, I think when it comes to any staffing, even if it's volunteer, um, the, the background check that Rod, Rod is doing is a little deeper than yeah. something that, you know, yeah. I could Google or, or what have you. Makes sense. Yep. And uh, by Monday's more, uh, board meeting, I'll have on a consent agenda the, the current fall roster of our staffing. Uh, there, there's, still some, there's still a few holes to fill. And... Um, I think we need to look even through August. Uh, there's there's just a need for some more staffing. We're, we're we're a little bit we're a little bit deficient, especially at the middle school level, with the numbers which are great uh, about kids participating, but increasing the, the number of staff that we have to really work with those kids. For coaching and assistant yeah, coaches. Yeah, coaching advising. Yeah. Uh, but on Monday's consent agenda, there'll be the current current roster of fall coaches. Yeah. Uh, paid and volunteer. Okay. Uh, with uh, the the changes are the changes are indicated in bold, and by that time you're seeing that all background checks have been completed. Okay. Otherwise, they would not be in front of you. Okay. Thank you. And then with new hires, I follow the same process uh, that's um, board policy, uh, doing three reference checks. Okay. And you may be doing a little, you know, reach out to my own hey, you know, you know this person. Or we have, we have a great person here, and then uh, Rod completes the background check, and then it's completed on uh, the season roster, fall, winter, or spring. Okay. All right. Um, next on the agenda is our district administrator job description. So currently we have two policies that address that. Um, we began looking at them a little bit as far as our, uh, with our dates process. Um, so Marie wanted to look closer at them and make sure that there's nothing missed. Did you? Because I think we need them both. There's things in some, unless you want to combine the two. Sure. I think it's confusing to have two. 
It's not unusual though. To have two job descriptions? It's not two job descriptions. One's a job description and one is their responsibilities, which may sound like the same things, but there's some definite differences between them as you read through them. Um, and I would say that they cover the same things just differently, so. Oh, I, I saw them as different things. One of them is one where you, you'd be evaluating on, whereas the other one is are they taking care of these things? And I can see why you might see them as the same thing, so. So you want us to re rewrite those as one? Well, this is the 1400 is the NEOLA recommended one. It's also yep. the one that aligns with our evaluation process that we've adopted. Um, 1230 20 is referenced in his contract, I think. So if, if we do, we have to redo that too. So that's, we have to find that out. Okay, so I, I think that, that was what he brought up too. The other night, when he was here. Keith? No. Was it Keith? From CSS? Yes. 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 I have no idea. It totally threw me. <laughs> totally <laughs> threw me. <laughs> because okay, I thought, back to the agenda. Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I just was. But no, when he brought up, what made me look at the contract or the thought on the contract, I think it was something how he had said it too. And when I compared the two, there are some things in each of them that is not in the other one. So, do you want to put something together, maybe? And yeah, do you want to, for our next meeting, yeah, figure absolutely. out which ones in 1230 you believe aren't represented in 1400? Yeah, I can do that. That'd be great. And I will check to see uh, what's referenced in Mark's contract. Wait, 1400 is the latest one. Yep. Um, so then, the next thing on our agenda is the DAPES evaluation cycle timeline. Um, so there is a link for you. Uh, we've looked at this once already, and I just said I would bring it forward for approval. Um, we did, I did push back Mark's uh, formative um, because he was out of town this week. So we'll finish that in August, um, and then the rest of the dates um, are lined up with uh, the suggested time frame. Um, are there any questions or concerns about those? No. Okay. Okay. So mm -hmm. that will, um, could that just be on our consent agenda? It's okay. I would think yeah. so. Okay. Yeah, I can already see it. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Then uh, the Board of Education 1718 meeting mm -hmm. schedule. Um, so, uh, policy 0164.1, regular meetings, um, states that we need to meet once a month um, and that our dates are come to agreement on by annual resolution of the board. Um, so it is something that we need to actually go through the process of approving. Um, so Teja had gathered feedback um, about which months we'd want to adjust our work session, and so this reflects that accordingly. It also shows our August work session being pushed back one week to um, honor uh, vacation time for Mark. Um, are there any other questions or concerns about that? We have to have an intro resolution. We do. So that <coughs> will be an action item on our July, or sorry, yeah, our July regular session. Um, would it be appropriate to put our annual meeting on here? It's determined at the annual meeting by the electors. So sure. Can't so be. I was thinking more from an advertising purpose, but you're right, since we're approving it. Well, it was approved last year. Mm -hmm. before yeah, this so year, 2017, will be on there. Certainly. Yeah. yeah. So I just so always think multiple yeah. communication, multiple strategies, multiple times. So the, sorry, because I'm not familiar. So should I add that? No. Okay. Good. Well, you can because it's determined oh. the year before. Yeah. Oh, sure. So you can put it in there. Okay. And what that? What is that date? Uh, I'll have to look back at our minutes. Oh, okay. It's, it's September 11th, I believe. Is it the same day as the work meeting? Uh, if it, it has been in the past, yeah. because it's always the su such and such a Monday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's probably in the September. And I did just look at those two policies. If we can go back to that after this. Say that again. 
after we're finished with this, and I want to go back to the 20, 30, 1400. Okay. So let's go back. Well, did you get what? Did you get what? Yep. You yep. The difference is basically spelling out more of the details. So you're right. It's all covered in the general rubrics from the 1400. So I'm fine if we take out the 1230 because as I read through each one of those again, I can see where they fall into each of the categories. It just speaks, breaks it down more into okay. more different words. I agree with that. Yeah. Okay. So, so, we, so what are we, we don't doing? have to put stay it with 1430. Oh, 1230 four. would, or 1400. Okay. 1230 just breaks out more of the things that we might see or that we should see or we would ask for. Okay. So it will not be on the consent agenda. It could be. Well, just 1400. Right. Correct. <laughs> how, we, how are we doing? Are we being really clear? Or? So <laughs> am I hearing you correctly now that you're comfortable yes. doing yeah. 1200 and keeping 1430? No, 1400. Moving 1230. Okay. And keeping 1400. Okay. So recognizing that 1230 is actually encompassed within 1400 with more of the specifics that we might ask for in the evaluation, evaluations, or might ask to look at, or yeah. might ask to see. It can't be consent. It could it be. A oh, probably to not delete a policy. policy. You're right. I think yeah. there's more stuff, more steps to that. There's a first reading, second reading, or whatever. But sure. maybe not with deleting. But I think there is. I think there is. I think you have to follow some steps. Right. right. You have the experience. Is it a is it a, a motion or an action? It's motion. an action. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's an action, but I think there's a formal sense. step to it too. You know, when you take the policy, right. there's a certain steps you have to follow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we will find out what steps need to be followed to remove policy 1230. And then we will have um, the remaining policy 1400.1 as a job description for administrator. And I will still check to see if there's a specific policy referenced in Mark's contract. Thank you. All right. Um, then the board member special committee assignments. Um, so per policy 0155, um, around this time of year, the board chair assigns board members to committees. Uh, given that we have work sessions, we don't necessarily need specific committees anymore, but there were lots of special committees, um, such as CESA 11 and the scholarship fund and things like that. Um, so I sent you out a document with potential assignments for this year. Um, was everyone comfortable with those assignments or were there any questions or concerns? I have one. I would like to still take part in the uh, strategic plan, core plan. Okay. So. I have one too. I think that somehow there needs to be some sort of, like uh, Brian was uh, uh, instrumental in that, the building stuff, the, the, the facility stuff. I mean, I think there should be at least a board member that just is on top of that. Yeah, I agree. I, I agree. It's a big deal. Okay. I think somebody needs to. Yeah. You want Brian to be it? <laughs> oh, I've always, had, I've always had the facility committee, and that really kind of handled it. I mean, and, and Bob was part of that too, I think. I mean, at least we can yeah. add to that. Yeah. 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 Um, so do you think that that is, do we need to have a, a further discussion about Creative if there is a need for committees? Um, or is that, well, you know, I mean, what would be expected of an individual board member who is well, the facilities I, rep? I think that would be under school liaison. Mm -hmm. You know, you have. I like uh, that idea. You have the elementary, the middle school, and the high school. I think a buildings or facilities liaison. I, I, I just think that a board member needs to be in that conversation. Because we learned a lot when we walked through that tour. We asked yes. for that tour. Yeah. yeah. And to have them reporting to us or to at least you guys, so that you can share with the rest of us. Yeah. You know what's. There should be a connection there. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, you know you can't let that stuff. Well, well, after that, that after, that, after that guy did that presentation. Right. With all the mm -hmm. buildings and all, I mean, right. so so we know there's some big things coming up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's always big money. It's not my deal. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't tell you no expert. Yeah, yeah. I didn't tell you expertise about in that area whatsoever. I certainly so. don't want to get way behind that. No, I'm no. more waiting okay. for my committee assignment. Oh, are you not on there? I uh, can't get me one yet. What? <laughs> well, we haven't created that committee yet. Well, if the committee was approved. Oh. Which one? Which one is the one? 
stack the files. Oh my gosh, shitty. How did that? All how right. did Brian Moulton's name get on my paper already? Like, <laughs> <laughs> what the heck's going on here? <laughs> 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 We're gonna blame oh, that's it. Fancy. <laughs> <laughs> what is going on here? <laughs> I'm not taking that. Oh my god. Uh, was that committee that we approved? Katie called the staff advisory committee. No, I can't remember what Mark is calling it. Is that? Um, the employee council? Yes. yes. There we go. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I've updated it based on your feedback. Marie, I added you on the strategic plan core team. Um, Brian, I added you as a facilities liaison. Okay. And then Katie, the employee council. Uh, is there anything else? Marie, are you comfortable continuing with the CISO letter? I, I will, unless somebody else wanted to. No, so if more. anybody else wanted to, Keep an eye on them. I just, just we could team up with them, <laughs> but I know we are because I, I know they went to the trains, and I'm very glad because it is a way to network and share ideas. Mm -hmm. And then, Brian, are you comfortable continuing with the memorial special fund? Yeah. Thank you. I'm on Thanks. the committee. I, I don't know what's going but I, I go and help. Perfect. Yeah. And I help. I appreciate it, so thank that. you. Well, well if you want to holler when you can't, that? if you want to holler when you can't, should just mm -hmm. give a yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think it, you know, it's, they, their meetings are too That's many. A, actually, I think a really stuff. great idea just because it's an opportunity for some of us potentially to connect with more community members. And, yeah. You know, I, I can't delegate time yeah, to the so well. They don't, committee. They don't really go to the summer, so you get yeah. that time off. Yeah. Do you want me to do the year, same yeah. with CISA? But I can't make it. Do you want me to put yeah, it out there? Yeah, just put it out there. Yeah, that's a good idea. Perfect. All right. Um, and then the last thing on our agenda was a proposal for an updated work session agenda. So because we, because you wanted to do Mark's evaluations uh, for the Dave's process during a work session, we need to be able to potentially take action and we also need to be able to go into closed session. Um, so I looked at some other uh, districts and their agendas for work sessions that allow them to have more of the relaxed um, format for learning um, that we've been enjoying during our work sessions, but also be able to take action and go into closed session. Um, so this is an example where one of our topics for action would be suspending Robert's Rules of Order um, so we can have more of the informal conversations about topics. Um, that would be coming up during our regular session for action, but then it also allows us to resume Robert's Rules of Order um, in order to be able to formally take action on any items um, and also be able to go into closed session uh, for Mark's evaluations. The only thing I would request is that we put it to the end so that if somebody wants to come, they aren't waiting until afterwards. What are we putting at the end? Your, if this is your example here, you've got five up here, and then we've got oh. handbook after, topic, topic after. Yep, so and I that's just an example, Marie, of how the yeah. information will be formatted. So I would just hope that we would do it at the end of the Yep, so you can see that the closed session example is at the end. Okay. That's an example from like during the work session, we looked at that presentation for dates and did some activities. The things that need to be done in open session would be a topic like that. Yep, but I would even have that to the end. Certainly. Because that could be it, done. It it's takes only extra an time. Yep. It's only an example. I just yep. wanted to show how it might be formatted. So it honors some of the things that are on here with who's responsible and the time. Um, it also gives us the objectives that we're currently on our agenda. Um, one thing that, that I was interested in adding is the guiding policies. Um, so yeah, I like that. I if, like we, that. Um, if a certain policy is guiding that conversation, we know which one to look at. Yeah. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to see as far as that goes? Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you for your uh, dedication to a rather long meeting tonight. We had lots of things on our list. It was. Um, but I, I, I learned a lot from presented and I think we had some really great discussion. It's always nice when you get to film yeah. mm -hmm. yeah, so you can really absolutely. see what's in here what's going on. Mm -hmm. What's the deal with the book? Um, so the deal with the book, uh, I'm sure Mark had Tasia drop these off. Um, this gentleman, Mark Sharon, I don't know how to say his last name, um, will be providing a welcome back message to all of our staff in the fall. 
and um, so this is his book, Nice Bike. Um, Let's take a stab at that last name. Sharon Broich? Sharon. Oh, I like it. Sharon Broich. <laughs> no, we'll see if we're right or not. No, um, Bruce Larson was really excited because Mark had been here, I think, about 20 or 25 years ago. Yeah, and so um, Bruce and Mark have both spoken very highly of him. Um, this is a really, really good book and an easy read. And actually, the entire staff um, was invited to get copies at the end of the year, or we'll get copies at the beginning of the year. So do we get to hear him speak? I think we would, when it's scheduled, be able to. Anyway. I can schedule the date I have it. Okay. I have it. Beautiful. All right. Um, thank you. I don't think you need a formal motion, so we're adjourned.